Council order. Clerk, roll call, please. Mayor Schlachter. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Ryden. Present. Council Member Barr. Here. Council Member Grove. Here. Council Member Valdez. Here. Council Member Milliman. Here. Council Member Driscoll. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, next up on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Council, everyone's had an opportunity to review the agenda. Does anyone have any changes? Seeing no changes, the agenda is approved without objection. Uh, item number four is comments and reports. It's time for the city manager, city attorney, and council members to provide report and general comments. We'll start off with the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. Just want to update the council tonight on a couple upcoming policy discussions, study sessions that I know uh, some members of, of council and, and the public are looking spe specifically forward to. Uh, we do have an update on the, the Tri-Cities Homelessness Action Plan uh, coming up on September 13th. We have a downtown update on September 27th, tentatively scheduled, and an update on the, uh, the, the Santa Fe Planning and Environmental Linkage, or the PEL study, uh, tentatively scheduled for, uh, for October 13th. So. Those are all uh, in the works. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you, City Attorney. No report, thank you, Mayor. Okay. Councilmember Driscoll. Yes, thank you. Just a couple updates. I want to thank uh, the Elks for their uh, uh, kids fishing derby this past Saturday. The winning fish was uh, catfish, 26 inches, if you care. Uh, the Elks are also having a pig roast this uh, Friday. Everybody's welcome. Uh, they'll also have a hoedown, so some music outside. Everything will be in the back parking lot, so hope to see you there. And I just uh, met a really neat lady uh, that just moved in uh, to Main Street, uh, Sweet Fire Boutique. It's a ladies' boutique. And, and what I really loved about her comments was she looked at Gaylord. She looked at Pearl Street. She looked all over the city for the right fit, and Littleton was the right fit for her. So I really applaud her for doing her due diligence and settling on, on Littleton. Uh, I think that story can be shared amongst a lot of our, our small businesses and why people love to uh, hang their hat in, in downtown Littleton. And final reminder, the parade this Saturday. I'm sure Kyle has some other things to say about that. Starting at 10. Thanks, Councilmember Millman. Uh, no report other than uh, my husband and I attended the criterion last week and we actually saw Pat Driscoll and his wife there. It was fantastic. Very well put on event, super well attended. So much fun. If you didn't go this year, go next year. And downtown Denver, or downtown Denver, downtown Littleton did a fantastic job of um, helping to host that event. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Councilmember Buddies. Great, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I had an opportunity to be a part of the meeting for the State of the Streets that was in Denver, uh, the State of Denver Streets, and the, it was put on by the Denver Police Chief. Uh, if you have an opportunity, uh, Google it, go in. They did video it and, uh, and listen to it. it. It is worth watching. It tells you a little bit about the uh, trials and tribulations that the police have to go through uh, these days. So it is definitely worth a watch. It's about an hour. So that is it. Thank you. Councilmember Barr. Um, just real briefly, um, hopefully I'm not stealing council member uh, Pam Grove's uh, thunder here, but uh, Highline Canal uh, Conservancy is holding a uh, nature play event at Riders Vista on Saturday, August 27th. Um, I only mention it just because it is a block away from me. So uh, if you can make it out to Riders Vista, uh, I'd highly encourage you to do so. Thank you, council member Grove. Uh, yes, hopefully everybody is looking forward to, or has participated in all the wonderful Western Welcome events. I'd like to make a, a plug for two of them. Tomorrow night is a wine tasting event and silent auction. Here at the city center, you can get tickets online or you can um, buy them at the door. Another thing that's very fun is that Historic Littleton Inc. is going to have tours of downtown Littleton. You walk around Main Street. You meet at the courthouse at five o'clock if you want to go to the five o'clock tour, or there's one at six o'clock. Tours take about an hour, and you can learn all about the history of Littleton, and then you can enjoy going to one of our wonderful restaurants afterwards. 
Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Ryden. Uh, yes, council members and members of our community, <coughs> hello and welcome. Um, I'm actually chairing now the Opiate Resettlement Advisory Committee for Arapahoe County. Um, so in addition to that group composed of different representatives from our county and other city councils in Arapahoe mm -hmm. County, as well as the county sheriff and the 18th judicial uh, DA. There's also gonna be an advisory committee, a part of that, like a technical advisory committee made up of um, substance use counselors and patients or clients with direct lived experience. Um, so that's gonna be coming down the pipeline to help inform the advisory committee. And that work is gonna be done probably in the next six months. So you will see something very specific and a plan laid out of how to spend um, the $7.5 million that the county's getting. So stay tuned for that. Thank you. Um, to echo Mayor Pro Tem's statement, uh, I just want to welcome everyone here. It's, we got a good crowd tonight. I'm glad to see so many faces here to, to uh, join the process of our local government. Um, and it's great that it coincides with, West, with, with Western Welcome Week, uh, this week-long celebration. That's a hard thing to say, with Western Welcome Week. Yeah, um, but uh, I was uh, able to participate uh, in the uh, 5K, the Pancake uh, 5K that morning when I decided that morning just to go over there and, and pay to run rather than uh, a run on my own, which was a great turn. There were a lot of people there. It was great. Um, and I was judge of the stick horse uh, race, and um, I heard from at least some of my uh, wife's coworkers' kids that they were not happy with the results since apparently I didn't pick them as the winner, but um, so sorry about that. Um, but also with the kids, uh, this is the first week of school. LPS uh, starts tomorrow, so all the parents in the crowd and the parents watching, you know, summer's almost over, so take a deep breath and you can relax um, a little bit. <laughs> um, another thing I want to mention is uh, Shakespeare in the Wild is uh, a, a theater group that is performing over at the Goodson Rec Center. They're starting their performance this weekend, and they have one next weekend. Um, I know it's over in Centennial, but I've been in conversations with members from Town Hall Art Center uh, to get that group to come and perform in Littleton as well. So that might be something to check out. It's totally free. They're doing it outside. Uh, they're performing a Midsummer's Night and um, free to everyone. Go out there and watch that. So I think that would be a, a great to support the, the arts in that way. Uh, and two other topics I just want to touch on. Every week I get a Metro Mayor's Caucus email with just you know various things, usually clippings of um, um, articles from around the country, around the state. And just two of them I want to highlight. One was they mentioned an article in the Denver Post about uh, accessory dwelling units in Denver um, and why it's going slow there. And I know that's a, a thing in, that we're looking at in Littleton here that's kind of going slow. We have the ability for people to, uh, to build accessory dwelling units. Um, and I just want to direct people's attention to that article. It was a good, attention, a good article about how ADUs can provide hundreds of you know, small housing units at reasonable prices across the metro area. Uh, they can also provide needed income to homeowners that can rent them out, um, provide shelter for aging relatives or uh, younger uh, children in there, and they can create infill housing. So I just you know, want to keep ADUs and accessory dwelling uses top of mind. And then another one thing uh, is um, they also mentioned a story, or several stories about uh, Hoboken, Hoboken, uh, New Jersey, um, that was featured in, in NPR, Streets Blog, Curbed, um, based on their Vision Zero success. And uh, I just want to kind of note this to the city manager as we move forward with our you know, transportation infrastructure, that we um, kind of keep that in mind um, through Actions with uh, improving sight lines at corners and restricting vehicles from parking at corners, uh, leading pedestrian interval, uh, giving those on foot a few seconds, to head start, walk the signal before the light turns green, curb extensions, bike racks, flexible bollards, high visibility crosswalks, um, lots of things. Hoboken is a town of a city of 60,000 in the greater you know, New York City metro area. They've had zero fatalities, traffic fatalities in four years. And so I think that's um, something that I would love to see happen here, um, you know, in the broader metro area, but also in Littleton. So just, just to direct the city manager, make sure our staff uh, keeps those things in mind. And so that's all I have uh, for my report. <clears throat> all right, next up, is item five, our scheduled public appearances. We have one scheduled public appearance tonight. We have the Next Generation Advisory Committee coming to present recommendations regarding an environmental, sustainab uh, environmental sustainability. So I'll invite that contingent up from the uh, Next Gen Advisory Committee 
and I believe Jamie Kraut is the staff liaison, will introduce everyone and they will uh, present to council here. Hi, I am Jamie Kraut. I am the staff liaison for Next Generation Advisory Committee. Um, for those of you who do not know, Next Generation is an advisory committee commissioned by the city council to help align with their values and to help provide recommendations to attract and retain younger residents and employees in the city. Um, Next Generation is very passionate about the topic of uh, environmental stewardship, and so this is something they've been working very hard on. Uh, they have put together two letters of recommendations for you all tonight. Um, that will be a full-time staff position for environmental stewardship, as well as a committee put together for this board. So, without further ado. Good evening, Council. My name is Gregory Anderson. I am a member of uh, NGAC. Um, I would first want to address the letter of recommendation for the uh, staff, or excuse me, not the staff role, but for the actual committee. Um, I do want to note that we do hope that this committee actually comes becomes a, a full board. Um, we also uh, believe that this is uh, in line with the env environmental stewardship goal um, that City Council has set forth for themselves. Um, we do want to point out, um, this uh, letter is actually available to everybody up front, um, but we do want to point out the uh, first two bullets. Um, this this uh, committee would work uh, in concert with a dedicated staff position that we also recommend um, to develop sustainability and climate change, uh, a climate change action plan for the city. Um, if you note uh, later on in the uh, uh, the letter, uh, it mentions uh, many other cities and their targets and goals. Um, we would like to see Littleton actually come up with a climate change action plan for the city as well. Um, and this committee would be uh, oversight for plans and codes related to sustainability efforts throughout the city. Um, that is all I have for that. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Susie Lanners. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Susie Lanners. I am on the NJC. Thank you so much for hearing us tonight about this. Um, so as Jamie and Greg both mentioned, sustainability is a huge concern for us as a committee and I think a lot of residents here of the city as well. Try to, okay, that's better. Um, so we are, we're proposing that the council bring on a full-time sustainability hire. So sustainability isn't just something that is done kind of in a corner as a box you check. It really needs to be integrated into everything that the city does. We believe that a full-time hire can be that person, that missing link between all the different activities of the city to kind of bring everything together into a cohesive plan and direction um, that'll give the city a path forward to sustainability as we continue to see climate change um, in our world today. So one of the things that we would like this person to do is oversee the development of a climate change and sustainability action plan. Um, this may require some additional work by the city, um, you know, such as an audit or an investigation to see where we're falling short, where we're doing really well. Um, but this person, this hire could help kind of facilitate that and again, bring in all the different sectors of the city to work cohesively together to build a better future for the city. Um, we would also urge council to act with some urgency in this matter. We see climate change as something that we're experiencing right now today. And sustainability is something um, that we need to be always working on and we need to be working on this urgently. Um, especially with the, the kind of slow process of government sometimes, we all know that things naturally just don't move as quickly as we'd like them to. So if we, if we delay this process, it's just gonna set us that much further back. And I think we're sort of at a point now where if we wait too long, it's going to be too late. The city needs to take action now to secure the future for all generations of Littleton. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sterling Oldemeyer, and I'm part of the uh, Next Generation Advisory Committee. 
And um, I just want to echo the comments of my fellow members that um, climate change is a very large issue that must be addressed. And consequently, we now have um, the passage of a new bill, I believe, from the Inflation Reduction Act, Act sorry, <laughs> that was signed into legislation by uh, President Biden. And it includes billions of dollars going to be allocated to many communities across the United States for reducing greenhouse gases and tackling climate change. And I think that um, the addition of a director of um, sustainability and a climate change action uh, committee or, or board uh, would be very necessary to help make sure that our city has uh, access and a plan involved with um, getting the funding that we need to start tackling climate change in a more actionable way. So that's about all I have to say for the moment. And thank you. I'll pass it off to Emily. Hello, Council. Um, my name is Emily Prezikwis, and I just wanted to echo what's already been said by the other members. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, just point out is that um, on the last page, we went through a couple of different qualifications that we would hope to see in a, this director position and a proposed um, salary. And we just want to make sure that this person has um, the necessary qualifications, for instance, that they really understand and appreciate scientific research and advanced knowledge in current trends, practices, technology, and information about climate solutions. because. Part of this role is to interface with the community and you know really um, make this information as uh, clear and coherent as possible. So um, we we put a lot of effort into this, and we hope that you can just maybe take what we put here and post it right online on Craigslist or <laughs> whatever you put your um, job posting, so that uh, it's as easy as possible for you. Um, and then. I just wanted to mention that we're going to be at Western Welcome Week. Um, we have a booth at Western Welcome Week, and if anybody wants to stop by and say hello, we welcome you there. Um, and if there's anyone in the in the audience here, I don't know if that's the right word, but and you're under 36, uh, you are eligible to participate in Next Gen. So, um, if you want more information, come visit us at Western Welcome Week. Thank you. Do you all have any questions for Thank you. Does, Council, does anyone have any questions for the group? Council Member Barr. Not a question, just wanted to show my appreciation for you all coming out tonight. So thank you so much again for the work that you're putting into it. And um, I just want to acknowledge that NGAC is not just focusing on sustainability issues. They are in a pattern of now moving on to other uh, pressing policy issues that are important to the younger generation in this city. So we're excited to see what comes from them next. And I think the city manager uh, has some deep interest in helping make some of these suggestions a reality. Sorry not to put the city manager on a spot. <laughs> it's okay to put the city manager on spot. <laughs> uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I echo um, Council Member Barr. Thank you for preparing this document and being really thoughtful about how it affects kind of this um, growing generation. I'm very grateful for that and keep it up. All right, uh, I just wanna say thank you so much. I think this is kind of exactly what the uh, Next Gen Advisory Committee was for, is to bring recommendations on issues that are important to uh, the younger uh, generation here and to present it to council, let council and staff kind of figure out how it works and make make things work. And so I, to the city manager to put him on the spot. Um, I hope we can have discussions during the, the budget discussion on this, if this how this fits and we can bring in the finance director since I told her I would call her out during the meeting here to make sure she's awake um, to see how the uh, uh, the Inflation Redu Reduction Act, if, that, if that's a possible uh, funding source for something like this or how, how we can utilize uh, those funds. But uh, thank you so much. Thank you for your time and collaboration. I will just, I will just, uh, just say that uh, I have, have read both letters. I know our, our city manager's office staff has too, and we think that you know the recommendations definitely advance 
the, the city council's work plan item around environmental stewardship, and uh, it'll help, I think, to r refine the proposals that we have for council to consider as part of its budget process, which starts in a couple weeks. Great, thank you. All right, uh, next item on the agenda. I know that's the reason why everyone's here is six, the proclamations. Unfortunately, there are no proclamations for me to read tonight, so I'm sorry to disappoint everyone. That was a joke, you can laugh. <laughs> All right, item seven is the, the reason a lot of people here. Public comment. Let's turn my mic off instead of hitting the next button on my computer. There we go. All right, so public comment is a time for members of the public to come speak to council about concerns, issues, or even praise they may have regarding city issues. I will ask commenters to refrain from speaking on the uh, campaign petition issues uh, as that would be electioneering. If you wish to address the city council under public comment, please sign in in the public speaker form. Uh, prior to each meeting. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. I will notify you if you've reached your time limit. I ask all members of the audience to please be respectful and remain silent while others are speaking. Uh, we are not authorized by the open meeting laws to discuss, comment, or take action at the meeting on any issue raised by a public comment that is not part of tonight's agenda. I may refer the matter to the city manager or city attorney for immediate comment after public comment and or to staff to obtain additional information and report back to council. I will also call those who have signed up to come down one at a time. Please introduce themselves with their names and address. If you are here to speak on any of the ordinances on second reading tonight, I will ask you please hold your comments until the public hearing portion of that agenda item so your comments can be part of the public record. First up on the list, Cal Murab. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Uh, last Thursday, I got a notice uh, from a city employee regarding a sidewalk in front of my one of my buildings that was trip hazard. Not, not to say that really infuriated me, because four years ago, I talked with David Flagg, who is no longer with the city, and he sent somebody there, took pictures. I ran to somebody else one time, same thing, explained to them the trip hazard in front of Grand Station Bistro. Nothing was done about it. So when I got this notice, I just get, it really made me mad. So on Friday next day, I fixed the problem for, for the city, uh, for me, I should say. And uh, if I can show you some pictures. So this is one of the, right? This area here is, is a trip hazard. Um, this is the other area. And what this puzzles me is that it looked like somebody saw it, the sidewalk here, and they stopped and they abandoned. But anyway, so I fixed these two things. Uh, today, I just happened to be walking down in front of your house, and I see this little tree abandoned hole. Then the next picture, it looked like it's been fixed um, next to it. So my question, why is it one fixed and not the other? Uh, this is the second one that I fixed. Third one. This is what Inglewood does with their sidewalk. They shave them. They don't growl them. You know, which this looks good compared to the one we have in Lalton. Um, <clears throat> this is another part of uh, in Inglewood. The one the, I, when I called Jeff, the gentleman who gave me the warning, I said, I said to him, I said, why isn't there guidance from the city what to use, what material, what color, what shape, what, how it's going to end up looking? It just fix it. That's all they said. Um, and the guy, I said, I said, you know, why, when there are more problems on Main Street, he said, Cal, I have 173 complaints. I've been, and I've been on the job for two weeks. Um, so I felt sad, bad for the guy, really, I did. I just couldn't help it. And then I couldn't help, really, the grand entrance to downtown Lalton uh, from Santa Fe. This is our grand entrance to downtown Lalton. I found out today these are not weeds. These weeds are six feet high. These are not weeds. These are flowering plants will take shape in years to come. Uh, this is what I call dead grass. This is right west of Sushi Basho. 
really, are we conserving on water? Th thank you. Your three minutes are up. And is it I up? It's up. But I will make sure the public works director gets your resume because it sounds like you're trying to apply for a job. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need a job. <laughs> thank you. <clears throat> Um, there's, there are quite a few names that are also crossed out, so I don't know if that was meant to be crossed out. I'm just going to read through. If you don't want to come up, just say you don't want to come up. Uh, Denise Weed? What was that? Oh, you signed in the wrong form. Okay. All right, so then Matt Duff, Kylie Duff, Tiffany Johnson, and Michael Johnson all in the wrong form? Okay. Uh, Connie Haddix? Going once. Connie Haddix? Julia Montano. Hello, everyone. My name is Julia Montano, and um, I'm a resident of Southbridge in District 3. I live on Long Avenue. And uh, I came tonight to express my support for Littleton's Inclusionary Housing Ordinance and just to express my thanks to council for um, supporting the proposal enough to move it forward and ask that the staff begins drafting the ordinance. The IHO is so necessary to make Littleton the kind of vibrant and inclusionary committee, community where I want to live and raise my children. Um, this is because as it's currently proposed, the IHO would require all new market rate developments to reserve 5% of their units to low income residents and additionally, it would provide zoning, procedural, and financial incentive, incentives to all majority affordable developments, those with 50% or more of their units for low-income housing. The Housing Task Force has shown their commitment to smart growth with this IHO proposal by including a number of zoning and financial concessions to developers because a 5% low-income residence requirement has a significant financial impa impact on developments and could threaten the overall viability of new housing construction. Similarly, the task force knows that majority affordable developments are the most difficult to finance and build, and so it aims to support and encourage them within our community. So my thanks to the council for supporting the proposal um, and implementing the ULUC, which made this ordinance possible in total. Um, and finally, with my little time left, I just want to again encourage um, council to allow citizens to call these meetings and make public comment either virtually or on the phone because that allows all residents, no matter of their ability to get here in person on a week night evening um, to have their voice heard. So thank you for your time and thank you for your work on inclusionary housing. Thank you for coming down tonight. Maureen Whalen. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Maureen Whalen and I live on Hill Street in District 1. I'm also a huge advocate for the work you're doing with the inclusionary housing ordinance. After all the work we did last year to help make sure lots of people were informed and able to contribute to the ULUC draft, it feels like a real win to be able to celebrate new ordinances like this that support housing options for many different income levels. I believe in supporting the staffs at my three children's schools, as well as the staff in retirement communities and nursing homes where I work, and creating opportunities for people to live near where they work is a wonderful way to provide that support. I'd also like to say I support the next generation sustainability efforts. Thank you to you all, and uh, I hope that progresses with their recommendations. Uh, in closing, uh, as a working mom of three, I also strongly request a return to call in comments. It is a wonderful way for me to stay involved and manage my family's daily routine. Thank you all for your work. Thank you. Lynn Christensen. Uh, good evening, I'm Lynn Christensen from District 3. A recently online report stated that the city has top ratings with livability.com and city statistics as Littleton currently exists, which is wonderful. However, if you've read the news lately, you know that there has been a large exodus of residents from Denver because they were tired of the overcrowding, traffic, high cost of living, and crime. If Littleton continues to go in the direction of Denver's housing policies, it's likely we will see the same thing here, especially with about 2,000 more proposed apartment units already on the development activity list. 
The exodus from Littleton is actually already happening in Littleton Village where I live. My neighbors around me have been selling their homes for a better quality of life and moving elsewhere. To be fair to the citizens of Littleton, I would suggest you do a large marketing campaign to let us know you don't intend to keep the small town, suburban feel separate and apart from Denver, which residents said they wanted through the Envision Littleton process that supposedly had over 10,000 public comments. We need to be able to decide whether or not we want to sell our homes now while the market is still favorable to sellers, and so our children can gra and grandchildren who are eager to live nearby can also look for greener pastures. The last time I stood here, I asked you to consider the full ramifications of not providing a transparent public process for new developments that addresses and mitigates citizens' concerns. I have also asked many questions about the ULUC, and those questions still remain unanswered. For example, how was the community actively engaged in the ULUC draft revision process? How does the ULUC protect Littleton's small businesses, small town feel, quality of life, existing neighborhoods, and jewels such as the South Platte River and Hudson Gardens? Why aren't there more applications for attainably priced starter homes for families and downsized senior for sale options? How does the ULUC manage growth? What process exists for, exists for mitigating adverse impacts to our community? How does the ULUC provide a diversity of housing types for all income levels? And how will small businesses be assured there will be enough parking for their customers with all of the parking reduction incentives? As our elected officials with a fiduciary responsibility to serve the best interests of all people, I hope you have the answers to these questions before approving the ULUC draft revision amendments this evening. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Lynn. Carrie Brady? Hello, my name is Kerry Brady, 6094 South Fairfield Street, Citizen Volunteer District 2. Littleton bond rating report. Read the full report. Littleton's bond rating, Standard & Poor's latest report, June 2022, is long-term rating, AAA, outlook stable. S&P affirms town of Littleton's bond rating of AAA. Standard & Poor's has affirmed the town of Littleton's bond rating of AAA, its highest rating. S&P defines its AAA rating as extremely strong capacity to meet financial commitments, highest rating. The rating reflects S&P's assessment of the following factors for the town. Very strong economy, very strong management, strong budgetary performance. The town's location at the intersection of I-495 and Route 2 with access to the Massachusetts, oh, oh, not Littleton, the city of Colorado, but I'm sure it is just as well because we have a very strong economy and we have very strong management and our strong budgetary performance is outstanding. After interest rates in many countries were cut in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, they are back on the rise. In response to rising inflation, major economies like the US, England, and Canada, as well as New Zealand, have already raised interest rates this year. Raising cash rates can have an impact on the value of government bonds, which have a fixed interest coupon rate. The price of government bonds is determined by whether the market thinks that the coupon will be higher or lower than the expected cash rates over the period before the bond matures. If the market thinks that the coupon will be higher than the cash rate over the remaining period, then the bond will be traded at a higher price. The combination of the coupon and principal of a bond is what an investor can expect to receive at maturity, known as the yield. For example, if the coupon on a bond rating in two years time is say 1% and the cash rate is expected to be 3% over that period, then the bond is worth less than simply holding government cash and trades at roughly a 6% discount to its face value. However, it might come as a surprise that when cash rates start moving higher, yields don't always follow. In this article, we cover why interest rate 
expectations are rising? How do rising interest rates impact bond prices? Should I still own bonds in my portfolio? Why are interest rate expectations rising? Central banks usually increase their cash rate when an economy is heating up too quickly in order to curb inflation. The economic stimulus provided by governments and central banks during the COVID-19 pandemic has led to inflation figures reaching the highest levels in decades, 3.5% in Australia and 8.5% in the U.S. This is above the average inflation target band of 2 to 3%, meaning central banks are now under pressure to start hiking rates. Thank you, thank you. and thank you for the creative plot twist. <laughs> Next up, Emily Dykes. Hello, how y'all doing? Uh, I'm Emily Dykes. I'm, uh, I don't remember what district I am. I think two. I'm off L Louthan and um, Kaylee ish. I just wanted to um, come up and talk about how thrilled I am about the IHO moving forward. Um, there's a lot of us that are really excited about that. Uh, so uh, I think it's critical that we, um, as a city, adopt an ordinance like this so it's taken seriously. I think it's really important to support um, organizations like South Metro Housing Options and um, you know Habitat for Humanity. And I think if the city's behind us, then it's going to help things move forward so much more powerfully. So um, my hope is that it is a support system um, to those nonprofits, and then I think it's going to help build out our future. Like it's going to encourage building affordable housing, obviously. But then it's also devel incentivizing development also, which I, I understand we have to have both. We can't just have only affordable housing. We need to have market rate housing as well. So I am excited about the incentives that we've um, got going on in there. And then um, last thing, uh, I've been reflecting a lot on last summer and all the recruitment that we did trying to get people to put feedback on the ULUC. And uh, it felt really important at the time, you know, because we got folks from who were unhoused, people who did not speak English as a first language, um, to all contribute to the ULUC. And it's because that passed that we're able to do the inclusionary housing ordinance. So I think if all that stuff weren't working together, we wouldn't be making the progress we are. And I am, I just want to say thank you. It's really important. And there's a lot of us who support y'all and what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Pam Chadborn. Good evening, Council. My name is Pam Chabborn. I live a block and a half from here, and a few things. Western Welcome Week, um, when I was a kid, I went to the Little Britches Rodeo at the Arapaho, thank you, Jerry. <laughs> um, Bellevue in Windermere, Arapaho County Grandstand into a child, it was grand. And you know, we had our little rodeo there, and it was based on the books of Ralph Moody, whose home was just up bowls just outside of Littleton city limits, but it was about our prairie life in the first settlers here. And you know what? Columbine Valley destroyed or allowed that house to be demolished a few years ago. So we lost that historic legacy that Littleton had. And I just wanna record that. Um, we let it go. And our museum could have worked with Columbine Valley to preserve it, it's gone. Um, I really appreciate the next gen's work on sustainability, but I think the city should do more faster. <laughs> um, it's not just young people who care about that. And uh, we've known for 30, 40 years that it needs to be done. Should have done something earlier, city of Littleton could have. Um, the inclusionary housing ordinance is the beginning, not an end of housing uh, affordability. I have to point out Again, look around downtown. The replacement of modest single family homes with five or six uh, townhouses that are four stories high are not accessible to people with mobility problems, not seniors, and not somebody carrying a baby. Shouldn't be carrying the baby up and down stairs. They're all $700,000. So this is not affordable inclusionary housing for all. The facts of 
the you all you see is that it produces gentrification and far above market housing that is inaccessible to people with mobility problems next to a light rail, which is exactly where we need housing for people who can't walk, who are blind, who have problems with um, stairs. And that was the one number that we had in our housing study. And we're not meeting it. The inclusionary housing ordinance should start with matching the Denver required affordable housing that they passed June 6th. If we don't match them and we're better than Denver, then exploitative developers will come here. So we need to match this first, mandatory requirements, and then add incentives on top of that. It's also really important to incentivize owners of existing housing to maintain that. That is the cheapest and best affordable housing, and it's better for the environment. And thanks, Council, for your consideration. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Emily Abel, your name's on here and crossed out. Did you want to come down? All right. Is there anybody else who did not sign up that would like to come down? I see a hand over yonder. Good evening, City Council. Frank Atwood. I live in District 4. And clarification, is this an appropriate time to discuss item 9A? Uh, that's the general business. I'm trying to figure out this. Code. Yes, uh, yeah. This is appropriate? Correct. Thank you. Um, I'd like to nominate myself as on, uh, as the um, view graph shows annual review committee membership, and we'll be seeing later this evening, uh, community members too are selected by city council. And as one of the individuals that um, vigorously was against this, I looked forward to being appointed in order to be persuaded to be for it. And so, um, the annual review committee membership, I realize, uh, has two selected members by city council. And uh, I'm, I look forward to applying for those and um, hope that you gentlemen and ladies will appoint me to the uh, committee membership. Additionally, changing topics, I was surprised and maybe this is common knowledge, and I apologize for being slow on catching up with it, that 12 of the Geneva Village units, I believe, are vacant. And um, I didn't, having walked the area just recently, I kind of was surprised at um, so many vacant units there, especially as we're discussing um, affordable housing. So. Thank you very much. Look forward to applying. Thank you, Frank. Your nomination is duly noted. I will make sure that when the application process is out, you are informed of that. And anybody else willing to, wish, wishing to speak? Yes. Hi, I'm Sharon Weichel, and I- um, Can you wait to the microphone so it's yeah. recorded? Thank you. I'm Sharon Weichel, and I'm a district uh, one. I mean, two, sorry. Um, I wanted just to um, mention that I do have some concern about the homelessness problem in Littleton. Uh, that's number one, and um, I hope that you're working on that. With regard to Western Welcome Week, I think that is fabulous. It's something I've always enjoyed in Littleton, but I did like it when you had the carousel of music and a lot more family events. Um, it seems like a lot of that was shelved for the bike criterion that really appeals to only a small number of the community, percentage-wise. I mean, it's okay, but, you know, for people that like bike riding, races rather, but I think there should be more family-oriented activities as well at Western Welcome Week. Um, also, <clears throat> I wouldn't be too encouraged by Hoboken's history because I was born a Jersey guy. <laughs> I've lived in the Hoboken area for most of my life, um, just shy of 40 years. And <clears throat> Hoboken is a nightmare. <laughs> they have a path train. It is so densely populated that nobody drives into Hoboken. There's no parking except for, you know, one 
giant uh, parking structure. They rely on the path. Um, traffic's a nightmare there, and the density is a nightmare there. You know, I don't know anybody that would want to live in Hoboken that's from New Jersey. People live there because it's close to New York, and they take the path to go to New York. But it is not a model for Littleton. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't saying Littleton should become Hoboken and just have zero traffic fatalities. Anybody else uh, wish to speak? Yes, ma'am. My name's Kathleen Murphy. I live in Wilhurst Landing. And I had asked two questions at the last meeting and never received an answer back. The first was, when notices go out about the meetings, about different subjects, whatever it is, it only goes to 700 feet within the development they're proposing or whatever. I get a notice, my next door neighbor doesn't. Why is that if it concerns the whole city? The second question I had was, why was the ULUC passed before this council was seated? I never got an answer. I'm still waiting. Thank you. I'll have city manager, city attorney address those questions. Anybody else wish to come speak? Seeing no one, uh, we'll move on to any response from the city attorney or city manager? Looks like the city attorney wants to go first. Oop, they might arm wrestle. Oh. <laughs> um, just a couple of <clears throat> updates. Uh, Mr. Mirab, with the, the sidewalk issue, there's a Littleton City Code that requires that um, it is the property owner has the requirement to take care of adjacent um, sidewalks. So that's probably why you got a notice. I know we have crews out in that area doing some of the maintenance that you've noted. I don't know if they've made contact with you in terms of perhaps completing that work for you. Um, but if not, I can certainly have someone contact you if the work has not been completed. I finished the... I'll talk to you after. after. You guys can talk after. Yeah, we'll chat after. Um, in regard to uh, a, a few individuals regarding the inclusionary housing ordinance, we tentatively have it set um, to come back to city council in a public hearing on October 4th, where we would welcome uh, any thoughts that the public may have on on the draft of that ordinance and, and, and their opinions. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Brady, thank you for the bond rating update. And in regard to Ms. Murphy's, um, I guess two questions that were unable to be answered. So in regard to why it is 700 feet um, 700 feet usually constitutes a, a couple blocks, a couple city blocks. Um, and so that's the number that is generally found across the board in terms of notification that goes to individual homes. Um, I will say that we also do notifications in the paper. We also do notifications um, physically posted on those properties that are going through the rezoning. So that's just the standard process. That's the process that the city has had in regard to the amount of feet. Can you, can you save your questions after? He's just, Sorry. just responded. Um, in regard to why the ULUC was passed last year prior to uh, our, our present council being seated, I, I would have to say, and it probably had a no small part to do with the fact that the previous council had worked on that specific ordinance for over two years, going back to the comprehensive plan that predated that. So their familiarity having worked with that was probably most likely the reason that um, it took place prior to this present council who had not necessarily been as involved in that process. So those are all the comments that I have. City manager care to add anything more? I think the city, the city attorney covered the bases. I will just mention that I appreciate Mr. Murab's uh, contacting me late yesterday about some of his concerns downtown. I was able to get out and walk the downtown today to kind of see those for, for myself. And I've, I have referred some of those issues that he, he showed uh, to our public works staff. I'll also mention that we're actually kind of excited 
about the WaterWise project happening in collaboration with the Denver Botanic Gardens at the kind of grand entrance area. Um, I will ask the public uh, for some patience because those those native plantings and those kind of lower water uh, installations do take some time to flower out and to kind of show, show where they're going. Um, with the possible exception of the uh, Maximilian sunflower that um, Mr. Mira mentioned, which is growing quite rapidly. But uh, we will we'll continue to follow up on maintenance issues in the downtown. Thank you. And if those get cut down, I have a suspect number one that I'm looking at. <laughs> <laughs> next up, uh, next up on the agenda is uh, item eight: consent agenda items. Uh, let's see, consent agenda items can be adopted by a simple motion. All ordinances must be read prior to by, by title prior to a vote on the motion. Any consent agenda item may be removed at the request of the council member. We have four items on the consent agenda. We have three resolutions authorizing IGAs with various counties for the November election and a motion to approve the minutes. So the first item on the consent agenda is resolution 49, 2022, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the Arapaho County Clerk and Recorder and the City of Littleton regarding the conduct and administration of the November 8th, 2022 coordinated mail ballot election. And B, resolution 50 of 2022, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the Jefferson County Clerk and Recorder and the City of Littleton regarding the conduct and administration of the November 8th, 2022 coordinated mail ballot election. Item C, resolution 51, 2022, authorizing an intergovernmental agreement between the Douglas County Clerk and Recorder and the City of Littleton regarding the conduct and administration of the November 8th, 2022 coordinated mail ballot election. And D, ID. 22-183, a motion to approve the minutes of the August 2nd, 2022 regular meeting. Mayor, I move to approve consent agenda items A, B, C, D. Second. We have a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. Let's be ready to vote. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Hello, everyone. It is Rick Hoffman. Okay. Uh, item nine, general business. We have one resolution tonight on the general business. Uh, staff will uh, provide a brief presentation. Council can then ask any questions you may have. Then we'll need a motion in a second. We can have further discussion if needed before we vote on the resolution. Um, resolution 52, 2022 is approving the creation and adoption of the Capital Improvement Sales Tax Citizen Committee and Charter. I will turn it over to the city manager to introduce the finance director or talk himself. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. The, as council is aware, the uh, Measure 3A sales tax ballot language did contemplate a, a, a citizen oversight committee to uh, have a look at how the city's using these funds each year. Staff has been working on this for some time and council had an, a study session on it a few weeks ago. So with that, I will turn it over to our finance director, Tiffany Hooten. Uh, she and I can give an overview and she, she can start it off. Good evening, council. Tonight you have before you a resolution that is creating and approving the committee and charter for the 3A Capital Improvement Sales Tax Citizen Committee and Charter. So the question before you, let me read that again, is does City Council approve the resolution creating and adopting the Capital Improvement Sales Tax Citizen Committee Charter? A little bit of history. In uh, November of 2021, voters approved a three-quarter cent increase that would go to capital improvement projects throughout the city. And included in that was the creation of an annual review board of some sort. On April 12th, Council reviewed their work plan, including creation of this capital fund, which is actually on a, a ordinance on second reading this evening to officially create that separate fund. On May 17th, Council adopted your goals, which included financial sustainability. On May 24th, we discussed with Council a capital improvement strategy, and we provided some feedback and received some feedback um, from Council and from citizens on the capital improvement strategy. And then on July 19th, uh, we brought the draft charter back to you for consideration um, for this evening. 
That annual review committee, the membership is gonna be made up of eight committee members. Uh, we did select one committee member from each of the current boards, Planning Commission, Transportation Mobility Board, Arts and Culture Commission, Historical Preservation, the Next Gen Advisory Committee, and also the South Metro Housing Options. Uh, we also will have two members that are gonna be selected by council from the community, and that process will be incorporated into the boards and commissions um, invitations in uh, early of 2023, I believe. I'm looking to Colleen <laughs> yes. for the timing of that process. What is this annual review committee going to do? Uh, they're gonna meet twice a year, once in April and one in May. They will present to council a memo of some sort that will review their findings uh, re related to any prior year expenditures on the 3A monies. Um, city staff will re prepare a report by March 31st uh, to provide some information to this committee. Um, it'll include the revenue that was generated by the three quarter cent sales tax increase. It'll compare any yearly revenue um, in prior years since the fund was created. And it'll also include a five or 10 year projection on any future sales tax revenues and any projects that we are considering in the future. The committee will prepare this report and uh, they will have a presentation to council in July of each year, um, comparing the use of the funds compared to the ballot language to ensure that we are falling in line with the intention of the ballot question three that was passed. There's always alternatives to any ordinance or resolution that's presented. Uh, so one alternative is to prove the creation and adoption of this uh, committee and the charter as presented. And uh, another option is uh, not to approve this and provide alternate direction to staff on this specific topic. Staff recommends the creation and, of the, uh, creation and adoption of the committee and charter. With that, are there any questions? Council, anyone have any questions? Councilmember Barr and then Councilmember Grove. Just one comment. Uh, thank you for the report and uh, looking forward to getting this committee underway. Since we do have such a uh, great public uh, you know, presence in the meeting today, I do want to encourage you all to try to come and uh, participate in some of our boards, authorities, and commissions um, in this coming round. I'm going to selfishly just say, you know, we work hard to try to recruit for these positions. This is one potential avenue you get to participate in the committee that was just mentioned. Um, so, but we need across the board uh, more citizen participation in these boards, authorities, and commissions. So I just wanna make a plug for that. And if this is of interest to you, that is one way to do it. So thank you. Councilmember Grove. Just to piggyback on to what uh, Steve was saying, for anybody who wanted to participate in any board and commission, uh, those notifications go out in terms of December, and then you apply in January for interviews in February, and you start in April. And that would include um, the Capital Improvement Fund, too. Thank you. I think this is a record for the earliest call for boards and commissions applications. <laughs> it is August, though. I can't believe it's August. Any other uh, questions? Nope. Well, thank you. Anyone care to make a motion? Mayor, I move to approve resolution 52-2022, approving the creation and adoption of the Capital Improvement Sales Tax Citizen Committee and Charter. Second. We have a motion and a second to e approve resolution 52. Excuse me, Mayor, who was the second? Councilmember Valdez. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Councilmember Grove. I looked back on my notes and we talked about this and I just wanted to bring it to everybody's attention again to make sure that we're doing the right thing. We have eight members on this board. We have an even number. We're assuming there will be consensus and it won't be a problem, but in every other board we pretty much have an odd number in case there isn't. And I just thought maybe we'd want to look at it again before we um, approve it and see if there's any interest in an odd number. Um, I, rem I mean, I brought this question up to the yeah. city manager as well. I don't know if you want to uh, uh, inform us or remind us again why we decided that eight there was uh, an appropriate number. I think, uh, Mr. Mayor, as Councilmember Grove suggests, uh, we, we think that, you know, consensus is, I guess it is a hope that it is possible with this committee and that if there is 
uh, that kind of, uh, if it were the nine or a five, four vote or something, um, we'd want to do more work to make sure that we understood those, those, those concerns and hope that we could drive to a relative, I won't say unanimous consensus, but that is what we're trying with, with, with this committee. It's certainly council's purview to, uh, to, to set that a number. So more like a sequestered jury, they can't leave until they've split the uh, difference there? We'll bring okay. in more snacks. Yes, I mean, I, I originally, you know, Councilmember Grove, I had your same concerns. I do remember at the, at the study session that, you know, my concerns were relieved with this approach. What we're kind of saying here is if we had a 4-4 vote, we might want to go back and look because there was some concerns even though it was um, not unanimous. So. I mean, I'm good with that. I just bring it up again because um, I just want to make sure that we were. Yeah, I think that's the idea. I think we always reserve the right. If it's not working, we can adjust the numbers later. And, but Mayor, if I may, I, I also think we think given, you know, the nature of this committee's work, if that, if that ever happened and we were really deadlocked 4-4 with the committee, that conversation could happen with the council and, you know, both viewpoints would be shared. And we hope that both viewpoints are any kind of uh, alternative viewpoints would be shared uh, anyway. Um, so we think that, that you know, this structure lends itself to the, the nature of this, this committee's work and it's gonna be you know, a report to council and some, and some dialogue in any case. I'm good with it since it's not quasi-judicial. I just wanted to bring it up again before we approved it. Okay, any other comments? All right, just to remind people, we do have a motion and a second to approve Resolution 52, which creates the Capital Improvement Sales Tax Citizen Committee and Charter. Ready to vote. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you. Next up on the agenda, number 10, our ordinances on second reading and public hearing. Uh, I think this is probably why most people are here tonight. Uh, we have five ordinances on second reading tonight that will each require a public hearing. We'll go through each one with a staff presentation first. Uh, council members can then ask questions of the staff. Um, I'd ask you to keep your comments to just questions just at this time for staff. Uh, then we'll open the public hearing. Uh, members of the public can come down and speak on the subject. Uh, after the close of the public hearing, we will need a motion, a second, then we can have further discussion and comments on the issue at hand. Uh, after all, if council has had a chance to share our thoughts, um, we will then vote on the motion table and repeat this a total of five times. All right. First up, we have item A's, ordinance 14-2022. An ordinance on second reading creating the 3A Sales Tax Capital Improvement Fund. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to the city manager so we can call the finance director back up after she got comfortable back there. I think she fell asleep. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. I will start the introduction and then ask uh, Tiffany to just uh, offer some additional comments. Um, related to the last item, this item now, this ordinance before you would enable us to uh, to follow really best financial practices in, main, in maintaining and tracking the Measure 3A funding by setting up a separate fund so that those uh, revenues in through Measure A can be tracked very clearly and that every dollar spent from Measure A can be tracked very clearly and can be reported on to both the committee that will be uh, established by, by way of the last agenda item, uh, and, but also to council and to the community. So um, I, while I may have just stolen all the thunder, I, I will ask our finance director uh, for, any, to, for any additional tactical information uh, related to this item. Clearly, I didn't read the agenda to know which order we were in tonight. Apologize. All right, before you tonight, you have an ordinance that is approving the creation of the 3A Sales Tax Capital Improvement Fund. Um, again, this is on the heels of the November 21st election where uh, citizens approved the 0.75% sales tax increase to be used for capital and infrastructure projects. I won't go into detail, we already kind of talked through this. 
But really what we wanted to do is we want to ensure transparency in accounting practices related to the 3A sales tax. We didn't want it to be mixed in with any other revenue sources, and so we wanted to create a separate fund. And that's the fund that the committee that you just approved is going to be reviewing on an annual basis to ensure that we're following the intention of the ballot question that was passed. You do have some alternatives. Um, you know, we suggest that you approve this and uh, stay with local methodology to, methodologies and uh, guidance to support the use of these funds. Um, you could also direct us to receive the uh, sales tax funds in the general fund, which I wouldn't recommend, actually. And then you could also provide alter alternative direction to staff regarding these funds. You know, we really just want to ensure that they're separate from any other revenue source, and we can easily identify those revenues that are going in and easily identify the expenditures that are coming out. We do recommend uh, the uh, approval of this ordinance. I did want to add just a, a little quick note. Um, I did send out some information earlier this evening related to July sales and use tax report. And uh, just a tidbit, uh, through July, we have collected just north of $5 million in our 3A sales tax revenue funds. So we are definitely seeing those funds come in currently. Uh, right now, you only have appropriated about $2.1 million related to some grant match requirements that we needed to ensure we had funding for. Um, but during the budget process, we will be bringing forward projects and revisiting the uh, capital improvement strategy plan that we've discussed previously so that you can see what projects we're recommending for 2023. And with that, if you have any questions, happy to answer. Thank you. Council, any questions? I have just one quick question. With the, with the separate fund, the uh, tax remitters, they're not paying separately, correct? It's all, all the sales tax is going in once and we're just removing that portion of it, correct? Correct. We have a sales tax system that uh, all, tax, all taxpayers remit into that sales tax system and then we uh, do a calculation to separate out the 0.75% of that and uh, uh, record that separately um, in our financial statements related to this fund. Great, thank you. All right, no other questions. I, um, thank you, Tiffany. We'll open the uh, public hearing at 7.37 p.m. We have no one signed up to speak on this topic. I can't imagine why. <laughs> I see a few hands. <clears throat> Good evening, City Council. Frank Atwood, I live in District 4, and I have distant memories that there used to be a Citizen Budget Review Committee. And um, I, I remember Amy Conklin trying to recruit me for it. And so it may be ancient history, but I'd like to just mention that uh, attempts at that have been out there. I appreciate you listening to me pri previously and uh, look, appreciate that you're not commingling funds. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Was there a second person that wanted to speak? Ms. Brady, come on down. Kerry Brady, 6094 South Fairfield Street, Littleton, Colorado, Citizen Volunteer District 2. Sophia Meller, Tuesday, August 16, 2022, at 7 a a.m., three-minute read. Chris Ratcliffe, Bloomberg, Getty Images. J.P. Morgan Chase, Executive Jamie Dimon, sees only a 10% chance of an economic slowdown that does not lead to a recession, while ominously warning there are 20% to 30% odds of something worse. Point the banking order. boss said on a client it, call that while yeah. the U.S. economy Mr. Brady, is still strong. D is this directly related to the agenda item about uh, the creation yes, of the is. three? Okay, if you can get to the point, thank you. 
uh, yeah, discusses Jamie Dimon's thoughts on what the economy is going to lead to, and then that is in regard to uh, what we're asking the citizens of, all, uh, of Littleton to contribute from the bank to uh, the community. Well, the, the voters have already approved the sales tax increase. This is just approving the account of the fund. If in this the is incorrect here, that's okay. 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 All right, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak? All right, seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing at 740. Yep, yep. Uh, motion council? Yes, Mayor. I move to approve ordinance 14-2022, creating a 3A sales tax capital improvement fund. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second from council member Driscoll. Any further discussion? Anyone on council like to add any? Not seeing anyone. I would just um, I'll say I you know this makes sense to account for the funds as accorded to the voters to approve that sales tax and I think it's a good a good process that we have here. So thank you for the presentation and putting all that together. All right, let's get the vote. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, B, ordinance 18, 2022, an ordinance on second reading approving a code text amendment and zoning map amendment associated with Title 10, the Unified Land Use Code. I'll turn it over to the city manager and his team. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, tonight we have a series of code refinements uh, that are the results of a process promised uh, when the council adopted the ULUC last October. Um, after having roughly 40 weeks to utilize the ULUC um, and four months now of, of detailed line-by-line -line discussion with your planning commission, uh, we have this package for your consideration as recommended by the planning commission. Um, I'll just note that hundreds of hours have gone into these clarifications since the code was adopted in, in October of love last year. And the refinements are really intended just to make, make our, our process more transparent and predictable, um, weed out some of the inconsistencies that we found that were in the, the ULC as adopted, and clarify or simplify the uh, the experience that the public has in using the, the ULUC. We look forward to further uh, policy discussions with the City Council about land use code in, in the future, such as the, in, in, the in, inclusive housing ordinance this fall. But tonight, we'll just note, isn't intended uh, to address significant policy additions or changes to the ULUC. It's really about those necessary adjustments to clarify and uh, simplify the existing code. Um, staff does plan a more comprehensive um, policy review for mid-2023 um, after there's been some time to live with the, the new code and consider its strengths and its weaknesses and have some experience. Um, annual processes like the one envisioned, I think, will, will help keep the promise of the ULUC of being, being refined over time with experience and evolving circumstances. Uh, we'll keep, I think it'll help to keep that, those commitments. Um, and I'll just note that, that staff is, is always happy to meet with members of the public and the council to hear interests as we go along, interests for future modifications to those, those goals um, as we've outlined before. So uh, with that introduction, I will turn it over uh, to our planning staff and uh, they can take it from here. Thank you. Um, I'm Justin Montgomery, I'm a, a senior planner. Uh, so what is the U ULUC? Uh, the Unified Land Use Code was adopted in October, and since then, staff has been working um, to apply the new code to projects and, and permit applications. And it's on an online platform that's uh, really interactive. It's in Code Plus. Um, it allows uh, 
it's a user-friendly tool that allows great searching features and the ability to incorporate graphics and, and highlight uh, definitions with hot links. Uh, I think there's a lot more we can do with this moving forward. Uh, in, the, in the ULUC, uh, the zoning districts are within four building blocks. And those building blocks are um, mirrored after Envision Littleton. It's the, the downtown, uh, court, uh, the corridors and mixed use, the neighborhoods, and the business and industry building blocks. Uh, the potential increased housing density is concentrated, focused along the corridors to help protect uh, the neighborhoods. And as long range plans are adopted and refined, the ULUC will be re-examined to ensure that we continue uh, to be in line with the community's vision. With these fine tunings um, under consideration tonight, staff is staying um, within the recommended, um, the bounds established by the existing original ULUC document. Uh, the majority of the code text amendments before you are clarifications, uh, which will help staff, applicants, and citizens. Um, now I'm gonna just go over um, all the changes, and, and obviously not all of them, but try to do a quick overview of the chapters that we are touching in the ULUC update. So in chapter one, um, this is the standard for all districts. Uh, most of the proposed edits within this chapter can be found within the planned overlay district subsection. Um, here staff worked with legal counsel. Um, property owners can decide to develop under an existing PLO on the property or utilize the underlying zone district by going through the master development plan process, which we'll cover a little later. In chapter one, there's also the land use matrix. In here, we're clarifying um, what the S means uh, and uh, filling in a couple of uh, land use gaps that we've discovered through the implementation process. There were also clarifications made uh, to accessory buildings, uses, and structures, and some of the sign standards. In uh, chapters two and three, uh, very minor edits are proposed in chapter two. Uh, that's to clarify references and the uh, certificate of appropriateness process for signs. Uh, in chapter three, um, we did decrease some um, density upper limits in the table um, that we discovered uh, the math didn't work with the bonuses uh, available to achieve those densities. So that's, that's why you see the reduced number there. There were also footnotes added uh, in the sign tables to clarify placement and adherence to the building code. Chapter four, um, we added the land uses that are shown in the main land use matrix uh, to the neighborhood lot and building standards here for clarification purposes. And we also made clarifications to the cottage court communities. Chapters five, six, and eight, there were no uh, proposed uh, additions in seven. Uh, very minor changes in five, again, again, more clarification to sign standards. We're, we're seeing we needed that. Uh, in chapter six, clarification uh, on approved plats and exemptions related to public acquisitions, and we removed a deed restriction. Chapter eight, clarified building code uh, applicability and changed reference to Main Street with the downtown historic district. It is with, uh, in chapter nine where you'll see the most edits. Uh, we're in this chapter quite a bit. Uh, this, this chapter contains um, clarifications made on which boards hear uh, the different types of appeals. It also adds a section for the future land use and character map amendments. Uh, we clarified when to use abbreviated site plans. And this also contains the master development plan process that is in line with the PLO subsection. Uh, we've made it clear uh, where uh, regulations in chapter three apply and to which cases. Uh, we memorialized a written interpretation uh, regarding the two uh, MDP paths, which is conceptual and detailed. And we consolidated decision criteria. The material being uh, reviewed or removed from the decision criteria is covered within the required content and design principles that are also reviewed during the process. So we found that to be a redundancy. 
And it should be noted that the site plan decision criteria is not being changed. And that includes consistency with the comprehensive plan. Um, so just for clar clarification, the MDP is a step in a development process, and after a master development plan, a site plan is, is typically required. In this section, um, you can also find the development summary table, and in here, uh, there's a footnote clarification um, that's been the subject of some, some questions, and it's a footnote four. And the reason why the entire footnote is not being removed is because it applies still to the um, major plan amendments. So it is being removed re regarding master development plans. So all master development plans would go to the Planning Commission for final decision. Uh, but it remains in the table because it applies still to major plan amendments. And in this chapter, we also added a process on waiver requests. Uh, chapter 12, uh, word usage. Um, here we staff, we found words that were defined but not used in the code. So we um, removed those, felt like we didn't need those. Um, we also worked with the building division uh, to clarify definitions uh, to be consistent with building codes. And on the official zoning map, we just have uh, one area that we're looking to change. It's at 1950 West Littleton Boulevard. Currently shown as multifamily residential, uh, we are recommending a change to neighborhood commercial because there are some commercial uses already established within that building. And with that, I'm here for any questions. Council, any questions for staff? Councilmember Grove. Yes. Um, this is kind of down in the weeds. But, um, Mixed use development, um, the decision criteria, um, just kind of refresh council's memory. Uh, when you go through any of these development site plans, whatever, they go through a process and there's a list of decision criteria. And a lot of them were taken out. And um, specifically, number seven and eight, and I think number seven, is someplace else, but I don't know where. I need to find my notes on this. I, I was told it was in chapter seven, and I just can't find it. Find in chapter seven. So, see. Just for chapter counsel. Chapter seven or criteria? Seven. Yeah, th there's a lot of criteria, and and there were two that were, I I, I think, um, yeah, important, so. <laughs> and I was concerned that they were taken out. Okay. They were in there. Uh, and uh, one is the effect on the natural environment. The development will not create any significant adverse impacts to stormwater management facilities or natural environment, et cetera. And then the nuisance mitigation, which I know is in the site plan. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, so with the effect on natural environment, so the decision criteria were not really moved around. We felt the ones removed were covered elsewhere within um, the required content or other chapters. And so for the effect on natural environment, uh, we feel the general content H, the environmental protection, um, it, it covers that, that aspect in addition to the chapter seven standards and a referral to public works during the referral process. Chapter seven, where in chapter seven and what was the other one? And then the, I'll look it's at really, it. Away. It's not in a specific uh, standard within chapter seven. It's just the applicability that you have to follow chapter seven with, with any development. Well, if I look at just, am I right that chapter seven's on floodplain regulations? Am I wrong? Is that, I've got an old version. Environmental management. It's what it, it was what it covers. Okay, so it's under set seven. And what was the other one you said? Um, the other one is, is general content H within the master development plan process is the environmental protection. And then we also send it out on referral to, to public works as well. Okay, so chapter seven and general content H is where? It's 10-9-5.7. Parent B, parent two, <coughs> parent H. B, H, okay, thank I you. I had that memorized. Thank you. Any 
Any other questions for staff? Uh, I just had, uh, I don't know if it's a small question or a very large question. Um, I think there's some confusion um, about master development plan versus site plan and this, the, and then with the master development plan, the conceptual versus the detailed and how those two fit together, <laughs> all encompassing under the actual zoning because that's what we're, get, we're getting at there. Can you explain that a little bit more on how all those fit in to make sure it falls within the, the allowed zoning? Yeah, uh, I'll give it a shot and then please supplement as I need. Um, so the master development plan process is, um, it's required for developments of a certain size or a certain type of development. Um, and it's also the process that you would utilize to request to use the underlying zoning that's applied on a property. So all the properties uh, were rezoned with the ULUC update and anything that was within a PD or a PDO is now within a underlying zone district and slash PLO. So those property owners have the option to develop under the existing standards of their PLO or request to uh, develop under the underlying zone district. And that is, you would use the master development plan process to basically get approval to move forward with plans that follow the underlying zone district. And we're, we've, we've gotten rid of PDs, like new PDs. And so with this, we're not seeing customized zoning. We're seeing how, how applicants will utilize the existing standards within the code that have been adopted. And, and for everyone, you know, a PD or a PLO, that's basically custom zoning that someone came in and said, this is what we want to do. It doesn't fit any of the zoning you allow in the city. We want to do this. And obviously it was approved since it's now in place or was in place, correct? I'm, I'm, can you repeat? So a, a PD or PLO is, is basically custom zoning that didn't fit the zoning yeah. at the time in the city of Littleton. Exactly. Okay. Yep. And with, regarding the conceptual and detailed, um, so the two levels, the, the conceptual level allows um, approval of like a concept that will follow um, will follow the underlying zone district, but it doesn't approve um, a development outright. You would have to still afterwards go through a site plan process before uh, you'd be able to pull any building permits. The master development plan detailed would allow one phase of the development to proceed as a site plan as well. And with those, we would get full um, site plan level details. And there's additional standards that you'd have to meet during the MDP process. And, and so I, to add to that, thank you, Justin. I, I would also add that the, the reason for a difference in having the conceptual versus the detailed is some of the, the larger projects that were contemplated in a master development plan process were going to take phases. They were going to be phased in over a number of years. And so it basically impossible for a lot of developers to come forward to um, our planning department with actual specific details as to how things are going to look because things are going to change, you know, in two years, four years, five years, depending on the rollout of their various phases. So they would then have to come back forward uh, with those site plans that would have those details. Okay, so then, Basically, the, the MDP, the conceptual, you know, a detailed has the concept, but it just has the site plan pretty much attached to it as well. Cor yes, at correct. least for one phase. At least for one phase. Mm -hmm. And with, so the conceptual is going towards planning commission. Planning commission then would just make sure that the idea for a development falls within the appropriate, within the zoning, that what they're doing is allowed. Yes, and, and following the decision criteria that are established there. Okay, yeah. and then so for conceptual, then a site plan would basically two-step, then they'd come back again through staff and say, here are the very detailed plans, and then staff would make sure that it fits with the um, conceptual uh, MDP, exactly. and then that thus the zoning? Yes, and okay. there's a, a pretty large list of decision criteria for site plans as well that they'd have to follow. Uh, but if, if we discovered a, a discrepancy, we would uh, require an amendment process to the, the master development plan if, if they were straying from what got approved. And, then, and with an amendment to the master development plan, would that basically just kind of do that over again, go back to planning commission to make sure that the amendment is approved? 
It, it kind of depends on the, the scope of what uh, would re require it. Okay. Um, likely it would be a, a major plan amendment because okay. the minor plan amendments are truly minor. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and then kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, not master amendment plans, but items that are, are smaller that are not necessarily going towards uh, uh, up through the public process. I've heard some concern. I'm sure we'll hear, hear some concern tonight. Um, what's the rationale for having some um, projects um, be administrative? Um, I think that was this, the direction that was, was chosen by the, the previous city council when they adopted the ULUC. Okay. I mean, is it more of that they're, um, that's just checking that it, that it fits with the zoning, you know, if it, you know, it's not something more like akin to a, a, a homeowner, you know, redoing their bathroom that doesn't need to, you know, you don't need to get all your neighbor's consent to redo your bathroom. Is that kind of that it's? Yeah, the, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. It's really, yeah. We just check it for the standards within the code. Okay. Mm -hmm. Council member Grove. Um, to follow up what you're saying, the difference between an MDP and a site plan is that a site plan is administrative, right? Yes, it is. Which means it does not go to public hearing. Where an MDP now, since we removed that little footnote, mm -hmm. it automatically goes to a public hearing. That's correct. Um, through a planning commission. <clears throat> Just fine tune. Well, uh, I mean, it was my understanding that a, you know a, a site plan through a, uh, I mean, there's various site plans. You know, a big site plan is going to go through a public process because either going through a conceptual. <laughs> Uh, conceptual MDP first, or it's going through a detailed MDP, correct? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a very large project can come through with the site plan? No. Some okay. of them are required to do master development plans. So okay. the majority of what we've been seeing are ones that are trying to um, kind of dissolve the PD that exists and utilize the underlying zone district. Uh, but there are requirements that you'd have to do a master development plan for certain types of projects. And does that does that answer your question? Well, uh, if it doesn't require a master development plan, then there's it just goes to site plan is what you're saying. Correct. And yeah. Just so that's so like, maybe something smaller. Right. So Jennifer Hanager, community development director. I apologize. I have laryngitis, hence the mask. Um, it just so we clarify that on our site plan process, it is still a public process in the sense of we send out notifications. Um, it's available on our development activity list. We ask for input. Um, so it is available for comment. So it does not go through a public hearing process unless it is appealed or the community development director decides we're not going to approve this administratively, we would send it to planning commission. So the site plan does go through even if it's not part of an MDP? The site plan is an administrative process that is subject to an appeal um, to Planning Commission, but it would only go to Planning Commission. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, Reed. Yeah, if someone had an issue with a site plan that was approved administratively, they could appeal it to Planning Commission and we would have a public hearing to determine the review of, of the community development director's decision and whether or not they checked off all the boxes and followed the criteria. Any other questions for staff council? All right, seeing none, uh, let's go to the uh, public comment portion of this public hearing here. I'll open it at 8.03. I will say we have, I think, 25 or so people signed up. So uh, feel free to uh, say you don't want to come up, you don't want to come up, or if you would just simply agree with the person in front of you. Um, you Mayor, are, could we take a break five minutes before we start that process? Uh, yeah, well, let's do, we can take, is there any, city clerk, is there any issue with taking the break after, if I technically opened it, if I pause the... Oh, did you already open? Yeah, it's fine. We okay, can, I just, yeah. all right, so, well, then we'll take a quick break, a five-minute break, and we'll come back and we'll do the public hearing. Thank you.
Anyone sees Councilmember Milliman, please direct her to the dais. Councilmember Milliman. All right, first up on the uh, public hearing roster here, we have Connie Haddix. Is Connie here? No Connie. We'll move on to Jim Finderson. No comment. No comment. Elizabeth Anderson. No. no. Uh, Tiffany Johnson. No, no, no. Hi, I live in District 3, mm -hmm. I think Haley and Lakeview Street. Um, I am in support of the ULUC because it is a policy that can change as the community changes and it can meet our needs that way better. Um, one area I specifically support is high density mixed zone housing. We are currently in a housing crisis and this could be a great part of the solution. I think the corridors are a great location for this and I believe a good compromise with single family homes. I uh, love this community and I think this policy will allow Littleton to grow in the healthiest way. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Kylie Duff. Hello, I'm Kylie Duff. I live at 463 West Easter Avenue. I wanted to speak today in support of the ULUC. While living in Littleton, my family and I have lived in apartments, rented a single family home, lived in short term rentals and hotels. We needed different options while we have been in between homes at times and options to be close to uh, the LPS schools that my four kids attend. Over the years, we've found ourselves in many different circumstances and I wanted to advocate tonight for a Littleton that provides housing options for all people. I, wanted to, I want to see the option for living in Littleton to be accessible to people of all along the socioeconomic spectrum. I support the new ULUC and I'm excited about expanding density in our city along the corridors. I hope to see mixed use developments become more common in our city. And I wanted our ULUC to focus on how we can make locally owned small businesses more viable. Uh, I want to say thank you to local officials who helped update the city's code and make a more walkable, bikeable, mixed-use Littleton possible, and where people at any point in their journey can find a place to call home in Littleton. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Duff. Hey, uh, Matthew Duff. I live at uh, 463 West East Ave. Uh, Kylie and I have been roommates for a while. And uh, today is my 40th birthday. I thought of no better way to spend it than with you all. Happy uh, birthday. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes uh, so, so yeah, I, I wanted to stand up today in, in support of the ULUC. And, and one of the things that I love about this is that, uh, you know, like previous zoning codes and a lot of co zoning codes around the country it was kind of set them and forget them, you know, for a while there. Uh, and uh, I love this living document that we have uh, as part of the ULUC, you know, where we're going to uh, continue to find things that need to be improved in it. And, you know, I was here during the, one of the study sessions last year when they were reviewing the ULUC. And, you know, when council was uh, in, in, a, in a, the, the squared up desks over there, and a lot of times people would say, you know, I'm not really sure about this, you know, when there was a specific topic at hand. And I appreciated that you know, because we, you, you all cannot be experts on everything. And, uh, and I feel like this really, this living document gives you the opportunity, you know, to say, I'm not sure, let's get it directionally correct. And then let's make improvements as we go in an iterative process. And I think that's an incredibly healthy, you know, way for us to, to move the town forward. Um, and, you know, I, I think specifically about the ULUC, uh, the most effective way for us to enable families to have their kids be able to move here and settle down here and, and to con continue enjoying uh, the neighborhood that we all love and the city that we all love is to add infill developments to, to you know, have additional density around the, the corridors. Um, 
you know, a lot of the, a lot of the small town feel that we love is some of the most dense parts of our town. You know, if you think of Main Street and other parts, that is a very dense part of town, but it has such incredible character and people come from far away, you know, to come spend time there. Uh, and I would love to see that expand, that type of development expand all around the corridors. Uh, and if we don't build more developments and specifically infill developments that are more environmentally sustainable than removing green space, like expanding and sprawling out further into the, into the undeveloped parts of our town, then we'll become more like you know, a California uh, with skyrocketing costs because they simply do not build enough housing to meet demand. Uh, and a small town feel doesn't necessarily equate to, to no density. Small towns um, are often, you know, like the old Main Street style that many of us love, we're often really like people living closer to together densely, you know, like in a Main Street or Old Town Littleton, uh, and enjoying, you know, all of the, the different benefits that that provides. So again, I want to thank you all for your continued work on this, to both staff and the council, uh, and I really love the direction that this is going. Thank you. Thank you. I'm half uh, tempted to suspend the public hearing and have everyone sing happy birthday to you, but <laughs> I will save you that indignity. Mayor, Mayor, if I may. You know, the ULUC has been approved. Um, I appreciate the comments of the last three uh, citizens, but what we're really talking about are just some amendments to the uh, ULUC. It seems like we're kind of going backwards a little bit, and I would really like to get on with if there's any objection to the amendments that staff presented to us. Um, thank, thank if I'm out of order, let me know. That's fine. Karen Stinger. You're against, okay. Okay. Uh, Jan Stinger. My name is Jan Stinger. I live in um, District 3. I moved to Littleton in 1959. And I moved away for about 20 years. After I retired, I came back. It looks like I might have to leave again, which is very disappointing because Littleton was so beautiful. And it was somewhat rural, but it was still um, a suburb. But now with the new ULUC allowing for 91-foot 90, high buildings, allowing for higher density, it's not the small hometown, lovely Littleton that I grew up in. It's, it's become sad. And as I see these um, commission meetings and council meetings, and we talk about this over and over and over again, and we even had petitions signed so that we could possibly stop Aspen Grove, or not stop it, but put it to a vote of the people so that people could say what they wanted to do with Aspen Grove, but instead they did an end run around us, went to the master um, development plan. And so basically our voices are not being heard. Nobody seems to care. And it seems as though the planning commission and the council and the previous council do not have the vision that I have or the vision that about 10,000 people had when they were working on different things. And I just have to say that I'm so sad to see this happen to Littleton, to see you know all of these townhomes butted up against each other, like you see all along the, um, what do you call it, the light, the light rail. Um, it's not us. And that was the one thing that I always took pride in, is we weren't Inglewood, we weren't Denver, but we might as well be now. And the ULUC is making that apparent. And so when we were trying to stop Aspen Grove, it really wasn't Aspen Grove we were trying to stop. It was trying to revise the ULUC, because the ULUC is wrong for Littleton. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your concerns. Paul Bingham. I am against this, but I don't want to talk. Thank you. Duly noted. 
Uh, Lynn Christensen. Okay, hi again, I'm Lynn Christensen from District 3. I want to begin by quoting the ULUC decision criteria about code text amendments, which you are contemplating tonight. And this is highlighted in the yellow at the beginning, uh, the top of my handout. It says, the amendment may serve to mitigate adverse impacts of the use and development of land on the natural or built environments, including but not limited to the uh, mobility, air quality, water quality, noise level, stormwater management, and vegetation. So why then are decision criteria for master development conceptual plans such as nuisance mitigation and effect to natural environment being removed for approval at a public hearing level? See the next yellow highlights under a master development plan. These criteria need to remain for the repro repro uh, approval of a master development plan to provide compliance with the existing code, cons consistency within the ULUC, and public transparency of nuisances and adverse effects to the environment that affect properties in the, vic the vicinity of the development. I'm now going to be referring to the gray areas of the handout. Compliance with the comp plan is required for a site plan and proposed language for the future land use and character map amendment criteria, and yet it is not required for planning commission public hearings at the master development conceptual plan level. Again, for consistency and public transparency, compliance with the comp plan needs to be a decision criteria requirement for master development conceptual plans. In addition, a master development conceptual plan was recently approved by Planning Commission, and yet a public hearing and approval by City Council of a conceptual plan had not yet even occurred. I guess this is considered technical expertise, and you can look at the green highlighting on my handout, please. I'm also asking that master development conceptual plans are approved by elected representatives and site plans by planning commission with public hearings for more accountability. I just found, it I just found out it costs $500 to do an appeal. Tonight you have the opportunity to approve with modifications or deny a text amendment. And I'm asking that you would, number one, not allow the removal of the effect on natural environment and nuisance mitigation decision criteria for new uh, developments from public hearings. Number two, require a master development conceptual plan to comply with comprehensive <coughs> plans during public hearing approval process. And number three, require master development plans to be approved by city council and site plans by planning commission with public hearings for more accountability. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Maureen Whalen? Maureen, Maureen's still here? No? Um, she was in favor. Julia Montano? In favor. John Marchetti? Is John here? I'm here. You want to speak? No, I don't want to okay. speak, but I'm opposed. He, John, John is opposed. George Lowry? Is George here? No, he was opposed. Right Where? Oh, I can't see his hand. It's behind. Would you like to speak? Okay, noted. George Lowry opposed. Uh, Pat Cronenberger. Good evening, Council. Pat Cronenberger, District 2. Um, I do want to speak in support of these modifications to the ULUC. I think it demonstrates 
how the ULUC was intended to operate to be a working document, a living document, for those of us who participated in the process. And I appreciate Councilmember Driscoll's comments about us not relitigating the ULUC. Uh, but for those of us who were deeply involved in its formulation and ensuring its consistency with the comprehensive plan, uh, I just want to be sure that I'm on record also as a housing authority member and a former member of the housing, author of the housing task force that uh, these modifications are uh, very much reflective of the intent that the document be uh, a living document and uh, want to uh, voice my very strong support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rick Cronenberger. Good evening, Council. I want to uh, speak in support of the UOLUC. I'm speaking as a member of the Historic Preservation Board, but as a private citizen tonight. The HPB was deeply engaged in the development of the UOLUC and has a significant section on historic preservation. The board met several times individually and also met several times with the Planning Commission to work out the language of the UOLUC, so we put a lot of effort into this. The HPB took the lead in the sections addressing historic preservation changes in the code and will be reviewing potential changes in the future when the city gets around to doing it. I personally, as a citizen, have read the entire ULC from front to back. I commented on many of the sections and attended every single meeting that the city held on the uh, ULUC. This is a living document directly tied to the newly adopted comprehensive plan. I wholeheartedly support the changes to the OUC, and it is the comfort that we have a code for the 21st century. I want to thank the City Council and the Planning Commission for all the hard work they've done on this section. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Athens. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to make some comments. My name is Kathleen Athens. I live on South Overlook Way in District 4, about um, a mile west of Aspen Grove. I'm very concerned about the proposed revisions to the city, city code text amendment associated with ULUC, which would remove decision criteria from the public hearing process for future developments. It is vital that citizens of Littleton have a representative government that allows for their input into future development. The master development conceptual plan should include input from the citizens that are going to be impacted by those plans. These plans should include how the quality of life will be impacted by the citizens that live closest to the planned development site. And might I say notifying uh, people who only live 700 feet from Aspen Grove includes almost no one that will be impacted by th um, the changes that are recommended. Traffic noise and the effects on the current community of people living in the area and the natural environment should be a major criteria when, de when deciding on any new development. The Unified Land Use Code should focus on what the community wants and manage growth, traffic, and parking so it does not have a negative impact on the people who have lived in Littleton for many, many years. The Master Development Conceptual Plan should comply with the comprehensive plan like a site plan in addition, any development plans should be approved by the City Council so that their elected officials can represent the wishes of their constituencies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathleen. Kathleen Murphy. Do you want to come down? And I can't hear you from down there. <laughs> Someone signed you up. <laughs> Is there, a, is there a different Kathleen Murphy in the audience? <laughs> I'm Kathleen Murphy, and I just wanted to say that where the ULUC <clears throat> is concerned, I agree with Kathleen and with Linda. The ULUC does not represent the majority of the Littleton citizenry. There are a lot of new people here who have no concept of what high density means. I was born and raised in Chicago. Believe me, you don't want it here. There is no accountability for parking. There's no accountability for the high rises. 
I, I'm against it, and that's all I'll say. But I did not sign up, honest. <laughs> well, thanks for coming down. Whoever signed you up, you might want to hunt them down. Uh, let's see. Molly Blakely signed up, but her name was crossed. Uh, was in favor. Pam Chadbourne? Would you like to come down and speak? Uh, I'm Pam Chowder. I still live a block and a half from here. And um, so, Council, the ULUC was never founded on any feasibility studies, on any good practice or professional practice of applied um, city design. We had no city design. There was a comprehensive plan, which is just a collection of ideas from people with special access and not people who are representative of most of us. Um, people who used to be on council and it ha are on boards and commissions and already have influence and then we're given access to the future land use map. It's appalling to me what it's based on. Um, it's based on people who had special access and people with special interests and the demonstration of that is Aspen Grove. Aspen Grove rezoning was passed by council in October last year. Almost 4,000 valid signatures were gathered to reverse that. But the ULUC was passed, and guess what? The underlying zoning now suddenly matches what Aspen Grove wanted. What a deal, and a bad deal for Littleton and the citizens. And how can you, council electeds, think that that is at all proportionate to what the citizens want? It's obviously not. The ULC does not represent what citizens want, and it doesn't represent good city design practice either because none of that work was done previously. Um, anyway, Littleton's old zoning was excellent. It was extremely refined. It resulted in a city with a wider diversity of income housing than most, and Kendrick Keith's consultancy said that several times, and it fell on deaf ears. We have great bones, and instead of protecting those bones and building out on that, we're destroying them. And one of the reasons we don't have housing on corridors is it's an unpleasant place to live. You know, if your dog gets out or your child, there's a big road there. They're noisy. There's pollution. They're a bad place to live. Um, for these revisions, uh, I echo what other people said. Uh, the criteria should be kept together and they're mandatory for approval. Uh, to take them out and call that simplifying is false. Don't say us, don't tell us it's easier, it's not. The criteria for us uh, for examination and approval should all be together, very clear, and that's easier for us to use. Don't tell us it's easier for us to use if you put them in different chapters. Um, I, 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 I don't know whether to say disapprove them all, but um, these are a bad deal for the city. Thanks very much. Thank you, Pam. Mary Billingsley. I declined. Okay, opposed. Yep, Mary's opposed. Is that Shira Weichel? Weichel. I'm in District 2, and um, I am opposed. I strongly agree with the people who spoke against the revisions. Um, I agree that the criteria should be together and not in different chapters. Um, I have concern um, about several things. Uh, there's a, per there's a um, perception in Littleton among the citizens that there is a push to fundamentally change the character of Littleton. And that is not what most people want. There, are, you know, um, dense, density does impact the environment. It does impact water. It does impact traffic. It impacts a lot of things. Just to say, oh yeah, we want low income housing. I have a 20-year-old daughter. She and her friends live in, you know, 
her, rather, her friends live in different parts of Littleton. They rent. They're able to rent. They just rent together, which is what I did when I was growing up. Everybody doesn't have to own a house in Littleton. Littleton is not Denver. It's not Englewood. It's not Hoboken, and thank God it's not. <laughs> you know, and I, I understand what you were saying about the traffic. But that's not what Littleton is. Littleton is a small town, and we want to keep it. You know, it's, it's a, I mean, there's a good population here, but it's got a small town feel and culture. Um, and I really would like to see that continue. Um, there is a trust issue in politics at all levels, including locally. And so when Pam asked about whether um, some of the criteria would be removed for um, public process, what came across as I'm sitting in the audience is that it's only going to remove public process for my bathroom inside my house. Yet my understanding is that some of these revisions affect public hearing on development. And if that's the case, then I have concern about that. Um, I do have concern about increased traffic, especially in that Aspen Grove area. That whole community behind there has one way in and one way out, which even without development in Aspen Grove is a huge fire issue fire safety issue. And then you're going to add all these, um, all this development there that is definitely going to affect the Platte and the Carson Nature area. Um, so uh, I also feel like things get pushed through. This is my impression, and I appreciate the opportunity for public hearing here and that you and all of you are listening to me. But um, people in Littleton really do, and the majority do feel like thing, development is being pushed through because the city wants money. That's the perception. Not for the quality of life in Littleton and not for what the people in Littleton want. And so, thank you. I'm opposed. Thank you so much. And note to self, do not compare Littleton to Hoboken in the future. <laughs> Dave Frazier. I'm Dave Frazier. I live in the, the Knowles at Southbridge. I've been a, a resident of Littleton for over 30 years now. Uh, we moved here in the 70s with my wife, who was born here and raised here and went to school at Littleton High School. Uh, I agree with everything that Linda said. And I do not agree with the amendments to the ULUC. In fact, I think the ULUC should be totally reviewed, re-reviewed, because to tell you the truth, I am not impressed with the results of the ULUC if Aspen Grove Master Plan, the approval of that, is the result. That master plan was, it is a disaster. The density is way too high. It's higher than anything built in Aurora yet. I mean, built in, in Littleton yet. It, it, the closest thing that resembles that density is Windcrest up in Highlands Ranch. That's the kind of develop, development it's going to be. It's too dense. The buildings are too high. In addition, the whole process was very deceptive. I attended all the Zoom meetings, all the planning meetings, and they were, uh, they were also a disaster. They were limited to 20 minutes. You could write your questions in advance. You would send them in. They might answer them, they might not. No discussion at all between the public and the developer in that process. Very, very bad. Uh, the, uh, the other deceptions included the master plan. Now, I'm an architectural engineer by, by, by training. I, I, I'm a professional engineer. And what they submitted as a master plan was not a master plan. It is what we call a bubble plan. It basically has bubbles. This is so this building here, this building here, no dimensions, no nothing. In, in fact, it didn't even have labels on the bubbles. It's the worst master plan I've ever seen. It didn't, and it didn't show any massing. It didn't show buildings. It, and it was, the deception was it did not compare the height of the proposed buildings 
to the buildings that already exist there. And they're 20 to 30 feet higher than the Alamo. That's gonna be a disaster for people on the other side of Santa Fe looking over towards the west. It's, gonna, it's just gonna look horrible. I, I am not against mixed use. I support mixed use, but this, this de development is way too dense. Thank and you. And lastly. Your time is up, Dave, uh, three minutes. This whole thing thank, puts thank your integrity on the line, people. Thank you. That's the end of the list of those who have signed up. Is there anybody who would like to speak? Frank? Good evening, City Council. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for identifying people who were opposed or supported even though they didn't make comments. Uh, what I'd like to discuss is the criteria in the con context of silence gives consent or does it have to be active concurrence gives consent? My observations of the Aspen Grove hearing was that too often there might be an issue such as crime at which time we heard no response and no, no report with regards to uh, Littleton's police, which are the appropriate experts, I would think. And that, in my mind, obligated the Planning Commission members to say, to go down the road of silence gives consent. Well, for myself, I was hoping to hear from the police active concurrence or discouragement. I think this is once again applicable, and my memory may be completely wrong, but with regards to traffic. Once again, the experts were CDOT, which provided, to the best of my knowledge, no specific um, input to it and was interpreted as silence giving consent. And once again, I would have liked to have seen, not so much seen, but required that there would be active concurrence to meet the criteria rather than just um, silence. So thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you, Frank. Anybody else that didn't sign up would wish to speak? All right, seeing no f other hands, I'm going to close the public comment at 843. Uh, does staff have any responses to any of the um, citizen comments, or do you want us to just ask one off? Is there anything you want to address? I can, uh, I have a couple of okay. notes, I guess. Uh, we Please. we uh, heard from uh, excuse me, my name is Mike Sutherland. I'm the Deputy Director of Community Development. Uh, we did hear from several uh, several citizens who mentioned uh, the uh, uh, nuisance mitigation, the um, uh, reduction of the number of criteria for a master development plan. Uh, we did uh, vet this. Uh, originally, we had added several criteria to the master development plans. We vetted this with our council um, and with the planning commission and uh, recommended a, a lower number of criteria just to uh, uh, make sure that, that uh, applicants were approvable in some form. If we had uh, 16 review criteria, we felt that there would be no applications that met that. Uh, so with, that's uh, part of the thought of reducing the criteria and some of the, uh, the counsel that we received as we went through the process. So I appreciate those concerns. I wanted to explain kind of where our direction or our recommendation on a direction came from in that, in that process. Also, um, uh, there, there was mention of the number of public hearings and the public process that goes along with these. Uh, the corrections or the, the proposed 
corrections to the ULUC actually don't remove any public hearing process. In fact, they add a public hearing process that was not there before for master development plans. The, the ULUC as it stands today, uh, the director could approve a master development plan and we are removing that ability. So wanted to make that clear uh, in, in some of the things that you heard tonight. Um, did I miss anything? Uh, there were several comments on Aspen Grove, and I'll just leave those where they are. Okay, thank you. Uh, just any council have any other questions for staff before uh, a motion? Uh, Councilmember Grove. Yes, can you speak to? Um, the proposal that uh, Lynn Christensen presented on uh, why the comprehensive uh, adherence to the compliance with the comprehensive plan was taken uh, was not included as part of the master development plan conceptual plan. Yeah, I can speak to that. So um, originally, that was never one of the decision criteria within the. It's not in the you know the original code. Um, so when we were looking at knowing that all MDPs would go to a public hearing, we were looking at consolidating uh, the decision criteria for the public hearing process rather than adding to it. Um, additionally, the base zone districts were all created um, with influence from Envision Littleton, and it, it states that within the ULUC. And then the consistency with the comprehensive plan is still a decision criteria for site plans, which would be the next phase of development. So that's, those are some of the reasons why we didn't decide to add it into the decision criteria. But site plans don't have um, public hearings, right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Driscoll? Yes, yeah, more just a comment. Thank you, Justin, Michael, and Jennifer. Uh, great job as, as usual. You know, I believe in the staff and, and the planning commission, uh, which, for those people that don't know, the Planning Commission is probably our most uh, um, um, professional-driven organization or uh, commission, board and commission that, that we have. Uh, you know, when we interview for those people, uh, interview for those, that board, uh, these are architects, these are engineers, these are these are people that really know their business, and I really, I personally really rely on on staff and that Planning Commission to give us good direction on on moving forward. Um, so I think these modifications are in line with what the ULC is supposed to be, and that's a living document that we're doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. You know, we'll revisit this again, I'm sure, in another couple months with more revisions. And uh, so I, I applaud your work and thank you for the effort. Uh, Councilmember Valdez. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I noticed some, the, the UC, it, it, this whole code business, we've been doing this for three years or more. Uh, and I know for some, it seems like it, it's brand new that uh, all of a sudden we just pulled this out of our hat. We've been working on this a long time. I think these uh, changes that we're making tonight are an improvement to it. There's gonna be a lot more changes coming. This isn't the last of the changes. It's a uh, part of uh, that, the complication that this is citywide and there will be more changes to come. So. Uh, uh, I, I, I did appreciate, I do appreciate the comments that I heard tonight, and we could have used those, you know, two years ago. Uh, we, we heard a lot of comments over the last two, three years. Uh, so, uh, again, we're going to have a lot more amendments coming up or changes to this, uh, the, the codes coming up. So, thank you. Councilmember Millen. Uh, thanks, community development team, for coming tonight and your presentation. And I agree with... Um, a lot of what Pat Driscoll just said, um, that we truly do rely on our staff and the Planning Commission in making these decisions. None of us come from a technical, highly technical background. Um, so we do rely heavily on you and also in the, you know, what our citizens are telling us. So, um, you know, each of us on council, we have to constantly weigh um, the wide ranges of um, ideas, concerns, issues from a whole bunch of different stakeholders within this community. And we have to listen to everybody. 
We work really hard in working with staff and with our citizens and with each other to try to come to the best conclusion that's the best for our city and our community. And we present those decisions to you all, to the public. And we try to explain why we came to those decisions. It may not be popular, but we think what, what we, th we think our decisions are good for this community moving forward. So, you know, we have to really balance some very, very, very important um, considerations. We have private property rights. We have the ongoing overall health of our um, economy, given the changes occurring here and regionally and nationally, and the sustainability of the city. So I appreciate everybody that did come out um, tonight, but I will tell you that the greater Littleton community did speak over these last three years both through the comprehensive plan and through the ULUC. And this was passed by a very, very extensive public process. So I support the revisions to this, um, this code and thank you to staff. All right, is there a motion? Well, I, let's, I, this time is for more for questions. We can pontificate after there's a motion so you know what we're talking about because I don't know what the motion is, so. <laughs> Would someone make a motion? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion <laughs> to pass ordinance 18-2022, an ordinance on second reading approving a code of text amendment and zoning map amendment associated with Title 10, the Unified Land Use Code. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve ordinance 18. Uh, further discussion on this, is there anyone else would like to, would you like to now, Councilmember Barr? Sure, yeah, now, uh, now that we're in pontification mode. Um, so uh, I just want to again uh, reiterate the thanks to everyone that's shown up here tonight um, and that also reached out to, uh, via email. Um, I'm doing my best to try to respond to people uh, individually, although for nights like tonight, it becomes kind of difficult. So I just wanted to make my points and my position and, and how I came to that deci those decisions clear, um, at least here. So. Two points I wanted to address, uh, one about the council's involvement in decision making on MDPs, and the second being how community input is ultimately reflected in those plans and designs. And so first, I just wanna be clear, I'm voting in favor of these changes. Because the proposed decision criteria that remain are discrete and measurable and objective, and some that are removed are addressed elsewhere in the planning process. So as long as we're able to create a level playing field where these criteria are applied equally is ultimately a much more equitable system of governance. And so um, by allowing planning commission to be a neutral arbiter of how these codes are applied to master development plans, takes the decision away from political figures such as myself, um, creating a fair system to apply those regulations and rules equally and fairly for everyone. And if there's a particular criteria that you feel needs to be modified in the coming years, as everyone mentioned that this is going to be modified again and again, um, then feel free to come to us to about those specific criteria. Um, you have the freedom to make your case for it and elect for and vote for council members to enact those policies. So deciding on the appropriateness of a development isn't a matter of policy, it is a matter of application of policy. So I just wanted to put that one point out there. Secondly, um, there have been, I, I received a lot of comments regard, that started or, or kind of swirled around the language I have not been listened to and our voices have not been heard. And I can say that for myself, and I suspect other members of council as well, uh, that we have heard numerous voices with a variety of opinions um, on nearly every matter of the city. And so these, through these public commission, or so through the planning commission process, community meetings, and obviously being here tonight, your voice is being heard. The more clear distinction between these two things is that there's a difference between your voice being heard and those specific requests being enacted upon. And again, this is something that you elect all of us for. You have a variety of opinions up here on how we approach <coughs> land use and zoning. And so, you know, that we are a manifestation of you, the voters, and how you want to see your city change and develop. Um, and thirdly, I'm, on a lighter note, I just want to say I'm actually excited about the cottage courts and really like seeing that be part of this matrix. So a lot of folks were saying, 
really focusing on the high, very small percentage of high density developments that we have in the city. But I didn't hear anyone applauding the fact that we are pushing forward looking at cottage courts as a potential housing option for us. So I want to say try to also see the good that comes out of these revisions and we will continue to make them in the best way that we can. So soapbox done. Thank you. Councilmember Grove. Um, some of you may be surprised, but overall I support the revisions that have been made because they've been very administrative typos and making sure things are consistent um, throughout. And uh, I think it's important that we have transparency. I think it's important that we have uh, public um, comments and public opinions. And we talk about the MDP process. We made sure that it goes to um, Planning Commission. Um, as you well know, I wanted to go to council, but that's not up for a discussion right now. That's more of a policy decision. Um, but we did get that made sure. We have a great community development group. Maybe down the road we may not. So I think it's important that we have that transparency. When the time comes, I would like to look at keeping some of the key criteria. I understand that we need to condense the criteria and that we did have 10 and now we're down to, I think, um, one, two, two, two criteria. Three. Three and Qu layout, mm -hmm. quality design, layout and quality design, right? Everything else is gone? Uh, excuse me. Point noted. Okay, everything else is gone. So I would like to add back, um, I'm not adding anything, I just don't want to take it out. The nuance mitigation um, and- nu Nuisance. Nuisance mitigation and the effect on the natural environment. And I looked at what you said, Reed, and I think what is in there in terms of the content is not brought, well, the, uh, the nuisance mitigation is not in there, but the environmental protection is just content, it's not decision criteria. And decision criteria is very important because developer needs to know what planning commission and staff is going to work on. Um, the public needs to know how this is gonna be evaluated and to give their input. And we, as council members and staff, are not perfect. Often, the city, um, the citizens come up with ideas and things that we didn't see and to be, have a forum for them to talk about these things. Quite honestly, I feel the citizens will have more passion about the effect on the natural environment and noise than maybe a developer would, than maybe even possibly a staff member would. So when the time is right, I would like to keep those two criteria in and you let me know when I need to read my amendment. Thank you. Any other? Comments? Yeah. Mayor Pro Tem? Um, yeah, thank you everybody for showing up. Um, I, I want to see more affordable and attainable housing options in Littleton. And when the previous city council passed the ULUC last year, it makes us eligible for some straight grants um, for attainable housing. And I want us to see us access that. So these changes that we're making here tonight is this is still an iterative ongoing document and I want us to see, like to Council Member Valdez and Driscoll's point, I want us to keep making changes so that we can make this city more attractive and possible to have more housing options. So I'm gonna be in support of these changes tonight. Anybody else, you have anything else to add? Okay, I'll, I'll chime in here. Um, I just wanna say Council Member Barr, very eloquent and well stated. I, I uh, uh, echo what you was said there. Um, so I won't rehash it too much, but I, you know, to the to the, the citizens that said that you know their voices aren't being heard, um, you know, as you said, we have heard um, your voices. We hear we hear. There's a lot of diversity of voices, and the idea that everyone in the community disagrees with this is just factually incorrect. Um, uh, a, a group of citizens do disagree with this, but a group of citizens do agree with this as well. And our job is not to listen to just one uh, constituency, but listen to the city as a whole and um, look at the big picture and think, see what's best for the community as a whole. And I think a lot of the um, uh, points that the citizens opposed to this made are actually being addressed with these revisions. 
um, that there is more public process, uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Sutherland said, that no public process is being removed, but actually is being added to, that now uh, all the, the large projects, the MDPs, are going to go towards uh, Planning Commission. Um, I do understand the concern that there are certain projects that don't have a public process, um, but that's, there's, there's a scale involved with that of what meets the criteria that is so important or so large enough that the broader public has a, a right to have a say in it because there is private property rights. I mean, that would be akin to saying anything you do at your own home, if you want to paint your house a different color, if you want to uh, do an addition, if you want to, uh, you know, what, whatever, you have to get the approval of your neighbors. And so for certain scales of things you do at your own home, yeah, you do have to get the uh, a broader approval. If you want to tear down your home and build a, a, a five-story building, yeah, that you need to get the approval. But if you have a small parcel of land that has um, four units going on it or something like that, that doesn't rise to the level of um, going through the public process. And part of that is because the city and the citizens spoke and they wanted a predictable process. The whole rezoning PD process that we had before was totally unpredictable. People were creating their own zoning however they wanted, and citizens didn't know what to expect. Uh, the landowners would come in. They had to go on the whims of seven people up here, um, actually do that twice with planning and city council, and so there's a lot of discrepancy there. So I think the, the delineation of the scale of what is appropriate for a public process and what is not is uh, important. Is it is it perfect? Maybe not, but that's what we have, and I think it, it works. We could agree to disagree that it should be 15 acres, it should be five, but what we're going on here is, is, is 10 right now. And I think the revisions that we have um, do, in fact, address a lot of the, uh, the problems. There is no increase in density in this document. In fact, as you said, there's a decrease in, in density in certain situations. And so I think the revisions here are um, very appropriate and make the document um, better. Is it perfect? No, but we'll, we'll keep striving uh, for perfection. And uh, the moment we think it's perfect, we probably need to do a new one because then it's not. So, um, and so I you know, also will be um, uh, supporting this. And I think some of the issues from um, people in opposition is this uncertainty. It's different. It's a change. And I um, feel that as well. I understand that because this idea of a, a master development plan. And you know, maybe in different realms, that's a term that's used differently than we're using here. This idea between conceptual versus detail. At first, I was you know kind of against that. I'm like, why? That doesn't make any sense to me. And then thinking about it, how we're reflecting back on the underlying zoning. You know, the the community has spoken through a you know a four or five year process of what we want through the comprehensive plan. This ULUC ties directly back into the comprehensive plan, and fits in perfectly with that. And I think this community has also spoken, as Councilmember Barr said, through, through elections um, to have people upon council to represent the, the broader desires of, of the community. And so I think that it is moving in the right direction there. And um, I have come to the concerns that I had with you know, the master development plan, site plans. When I thought about it, you know, that's why I was asking staff about that. I think that makes a lot of sense with coming back through that zoning is one of the talking points that staff and council had is that we wanted to say what we want in Littleton, not what's prohibited. And so our zoning says, these are the things that you can do here. If you're doing these things, we're going to let you do them. And it's been vetted and staff is saying, yep, checks the boxes, they can do it. Um, and so I think that's uh, a good step in the right direction. So. Well, if anyone else has any comments, I'm going to turn to, well, we don't have a, um, we, or Councilmember Grove would like to make an amendment, I've heard. Did you say you wanted to? Or we're going to vote on the uh, uh, motion on the table. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I think for the reasons I mentioned before, um, to maintain some criteria and make it go from two to four, and um, make sure it's broad enough and that it's defensible legally to in case we get an appeal. So uh, 
I propose an amendment to item 22-144 on the Unified Land Use Code update in section 10-9-5.7 on the Master Development Plan leave in the following decision criteria. Effect on the natural environment. The development will not create any significant adverse impacts on stormwater, management facilities, or the natural environment, including water, air vegetation, and other environmental features. Also, the nuance mitigation, the nuisance mitigation, excuse me, design is not likely to result in nuisances, including, but not limited to, noise, dust, light, or vibrations. Second. Okay, there is a motion and a second um, to amend uh, section 10-9-5.7 master development plan, subsection C, decision criteria um, to put reinsert the, uh, what's crossed out there, seven, effect of a natural environment, and eight, uh, nuisance mitigation. <coughs> Uh, would you like to, is there any other further explanation on that? No, I, I think I mm-hmm. mentioned my rationale for bringing this forward. Okay. Council, any other thoughts or discussion on this or questions for staff regarding this amendment? Uh, Councilmember Millen? I'd like to ask staff, um, in adding this back in, how is that going to change the process so, going forward from what it was Right. I'm sorry. Yeah. So one of the larger reasons that this was actually removed is that we have now created a process um, of MDP conceptual and MDP detailed. An MDP conceptual would not be showing anything of how they can meet this criteria. So, for example, the nuisance mitigation, it's referring to buildings. A MDP conceptual has no buildings. Um, same with the environmental impact. We won't have any of those necessary studies at an MDP conceptual level. Again, these are issues that would be addressed in the site plan level. I, I have a follow-up question. So the difference would be that it's the conceptual is not detailed enough. To, I'll just use light, for example, that they don't know what lights they're going to use um, and so it's, there's an inability for the planning commission to say, yeah, you know, these lights, you know, maybe they're going to point lights directly into, you know, their, their neighbors. And that would obviously be a nuisance, but Correct. this one, a, a conceptual so, would not have that, those details. Correct. So, um, further example, so the crime prevention, um, criteria that was in there that is actually referring to a process or, um, a way that the police can actually, uh, evaluate the built environment if there are blind spots, if this is where somebody could hang out. But at an MDP conceptual level, there is not that detail. So if we have that decision criteria in there, there's no way for Planning Commission to properly evaluate that criteria because there's nothing to evaluate. Is there an ability to make it just for detailed master development plans? I mean, other criteria? And that is something that we've discussed as staff. And then we started, we felt like we were delving into more of a policy level discussion. So again. So difference between conceptual and, and detailed? Well, not, not that aspect, but when we're talking about okay. that, the level, if we differentiate between what the criteria is for conceptual versus what it is for detailed. That's, that's when we felt as staff, that's, yeah, we that's were delving point. into a more policy level discussion that <clears throat> we set the bar that that is not where we were going with these clarifications. These are clarifications to the existing part and the next phase that we have that council member Valdez referred to is coming next year. And we really look forward to working with our community and council and planning commission on those policy level changes. Thanks. Okay. Council member, the, are you done? Council yeah, member? well, thank you for that explanation. And um, I'm going to humbly not support that amendment. So, but thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, just to s- summarize, it sounds like we're handcuffed 
cuffing you guys for making decisions and if we were to pass this amendment. Is that accurate? <laughs> Since legal said no comment, I'm going to say no yeah, comment. Yeah, I think too. that's exactly what we're doing, so I'm not going to support this amendment. Yeah, Councilmember Grove. This doesn't, um, in the um, changes, it doesn't say this decision criteria is only for the conceptual or the detailed. This is what my understanding is. We used to have a P4 process, and this conceptual is replacing that. And the P4 process, no? So just a reminder, so City Council did approve the underlying zoning as part of the ULUC adoption in October of 2021. And at that time, you basically created a list of what was available and what is acceptable for the City of Littleton to occur in each zoning district. So the P4 process was a rezone, is a step to a rezoning process. The MDP is not a rezoning process. Okay, I'm very confused now. When a MDP process is evaluated, they have criteria, right? And these are the criteria of a detailed one. It doesn't say that here, but that's what the assumption is, right? I don't know what this could, I understand a conceptual is not going to have detail and may just be a, exactly, it, it's, it's just, is this in line? Do you think we're going in the right direction? It's, it's purposely meant to be vague so some a developer doesn't incur a lot of cost getting to a detailed point and have it rejected. Get that. But this is the criteria the Planning Commission is going to use to evaluate. And that's what I thought we were taking away and adding and doing all that stuff. So if we're taking away, to me that's still administrative, if that's administrative, that's not policy. And leaving some of it in for a, first of all, for a detailed plan, not the conceptual. Do I need to revise my amendment? So if I may uh, try and answer that okay. question. Sorry. Uh, no, no, not at all. It's a great line of questioning. Um, no one gets to skip the site plan step, no matter whether it's conceptual or detailed. The yep. decision criteria you have asked for, staff believes that is covered in the site plan criteria. So if someone comes in with a, with a conceptual plan, and if, if it's the wish of council, we can make it work. Uh, whatever you decide to do, we can make it work. But uh, we do believe that um, the, the amendment that you have proposed, those are built into the, both the detailed uh, master development plan and site plans. And if you come in with a conceptual uh, MDP, the criteria that are, are recommended under the, the original motion um, provide a sufficient level of, of direction and discretion for the Planning Commission to make a, a decision on a conceptual site de uh, master development plan. And then no one gets to skip a step. That site plan is required, whether it's with the conceptual or the detailed, and then the decision criteria that you want to have in there will be there. Um, I'm not sure if that's a clear well, explanation I, for you, I but I gave it a second? shot. So the decision criteria for MDP, it makes no distinction between conceptual or detailed. Both of them follow these criteria. And so what I'm hearing staff saying, if those two, which I, I, I like the um, point for adding those in there, I support that in theory, is that if, if a developer is coming through a conceptual plan, they cannot meet that because it's conceptual. This makes no dis distinction between the detailed or conceptual master de development plan, which both go towards t to planning commission. And I, th I think if it were just to the detailed plan, I would support the amendment, but I think as staff said, that kind of got into the policy of different criteria, different avenues for the two master development plan paths. 
Does that make sense? Am I did I your staff um, did I say that correctly? No, I understand what I you're I, I understand what you're saying. I just think that that criteria should be in there. At the conceptual level, it's not going to be a lot of detail. Um, we're going to do an, a, an environmental analysis, and we're going to make sure our lighting complies with whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not going to be a lot of detail, but I still think those two things should be in there because, in my opinion, environmental protection is in the content section um, is vague, and the um, and number eight isn't even in there. It is in the site plan. In the site plan, you don't have anything about um, environment. Site plan has uh, the nuisance stuff, but not the other stuff. So I would like to keep it in. Any and other qu questions or comments on the amendment? All right. Um, I'll try to get this up. I just want to let uh, Councilmember Grove know. You know, I agree with the um, rationale behind this, but I think putting this in here causes unnecessary ripples that are problematic, and we can figure out how to make this work in the future. Let's scroll up here. All right. So we have a motion and a second. We are voting on the amendment just to add those two. Um, uh, uh, decision criteria into the document. So this is just the amendment. A vote yes approves the two decision criteria back into it. A vote no keeps the document as proposed by staff. Is that clear for everyone? The vote is one in favor, six opposed, with Council Member Grove voting yes, the motion fails. Okay, we're back to the main motion, unamended on the table. Anybody have any other things they'd like to say or amend before it? Seeing none, let's vote on the the main motion, let me read it again just so we're clear here, is to approve Ordinance 18 2022 on second reading, approving a code text amendment and zoning map amendment associated with Title 10, the Unified Land Use Code. Wait, where did it go? The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. All right. Thank you for that. Um, that was just the second of five public hearings. Oh, I Granicus logged out here. Uh, all right. Um, let me see if I can find the next. Uh, I just, I'll, I'll get it open here. Let me just. Uh, it is. Let's see. Residence resolution. Ordinance, uh, item C, Ordinance 15, 2022, an ordinance on second reading submitted to the registered electors of the city of Littleton, Colorado, a ballot question regarding a lodger's tax to support arts, culture, and tourism. So we will have a presentation by staff. Uh, we can ask questions of staff, then we'll open a public hearing. And then after that, if council has any questions raised by that, um, and then we'll need a motion. And after a motion, we can talk about if you're for or against it. So. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. My, my introduction of this item will really apply to each of the ballot measures forthcoming, so I'll be extremely short with the rest of, of them. So I will just say that this measure for the, a potential lodger's tax um, has been the subject of, of extensive community engagement processes for a number of months, and Council has had several uh, study sessions um, that have kind of resulted in this point where uh, staff had direction to bring back these measures for uh, ballot language consideration for the upcoming election. And with that, I will turn this one over to our, our Cultural and Media Services Director, Kelly Nardi, and our Finance Director, Tiffany Hooten. Thank you, City Manager. Good evening, Council, and good evening. Mike. Good evening, Council, and good evening, citizens. Uh, I'm Kelly Nardi, Director of Cultural Media Services, and my lovely assistant is the Finance Director, <laughs> Tiffany Hooten. Um, we'll try to keep this a brief presentation. Um, the policy question for you tonight is, does Council support placing a question on the November 8th, 2022 ballot 
to create a 5% lodger's tax. The council has explored asking voters to consider a lodger's tax with the proceeds directed to arts, culture, and tourism since 2016 through the biannual resident survey showing strong resident support. And in fact, we'll be presenting the results of the 2022 resident survey to you next week. I just got those today. And again, the same as in 2020, uh, support for lodger's tax dedicated to arts, culture, and tourism came in at 71%. In 2019, Council created the Lilton Arts and Culture Commission, who created and presented to Council a strategic plan and a work plan in 2021, including an objective to identify sources of revenue to support the arts. In 2021, Council adopted Goal 5, Arts, Culture, and Tourism. And in 2022, Council reaffirmed this goal and provided direction for staff to further study a potential lodger's tax. Some of the prior actions and discussions. Um, March 22nd, Arts, Culture, Arts and Culture Commission recommended a lodger's tax with proceeds directed to arts, culture, and tourism. Council reviewed its work plan in April that included a potential lodger's tax. April 19th, Council approved a resolution re releasing a budget proviso for a community research and engagement project. Council did adopt its eight goals and objectives on May 17th. Arts, culture, and tourism was goal five. And on July 19th, Council heard a presentation with the polling results and discussed the 5% lodger's tax. Uh, the engagement results that were presented to Council are as follows. 300 likely voters in a telephone poll found 64% uh, um, support for lodger's tax. 52% say Littleton's on the right track, which is up from 2021. 68% approve of the job the city of Littleton government is doing. And 64% are satisfied with the value they receive in terms of taxes paid. A survey in June of 2022 that was sent to 19 arts culture organizations in the community found all of them would support the lodger's tax and would share that information with their patrons and supporters. A uh, conversation with hotel owners and managers by our economic development staff over the last few months found little or no concern that a lodger's tax would cause them to be less competitive than other hotels in the area. Uh, if council decides to place this on the ballot and if voters approve of a lodger's tax, a file ru final rulemaking will be developed for council to review. Uh, the current recommendation from the Arts and Culture Commission is that 60% of the proceeds would go to what we have labeled the big four, Bemis Library, Littleton Museum, Town Hall, and Hudson Gardens. 20% of the proceeds, uh, a small grant program. We've identified more than 100 smaller arts and culture organizations within Littleton city limits. And we also think that this would help increase the number of arts and culture groups that would want to move to Littleton because of a grant program like this. And then the final 20% would go for a destination tourism marketing campaign uh, to mark little, market Littleton's assets uh, to the region to get more people to come to Littleton and um, shop in our stores, visit our restaurants, and take advantage of all the great amenities that we have here. Um, the lodger's tax, as written, would exclude rentals greater than 29 consecutive days. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Any questions, Council? Yeah, just one. Yeah. Uh, so Airbnbs would be not, ex they would not be excluded, correct? They would be included, yes. They would be included. <laughs> That's yes. a better way of putting that. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, Council? As well as short-term rentals would be included in this. I just have uh, one question on the uh, the rule making after the after the fact, assuming the voters approve it. Um, would what's the process of that? Would that be an ordinance, a resolution? Would those? Um, I know it's just a recommendation, but say Council accepts it, would those percentages be set in stone? Would they be more guidelines? Would that be up for discussion of how it's done? I, I just wanted to. Yeah, it's up to council ultimately in terms of the <clears throat> form. I would say most of our fees when we're deciding stuff like that comes to council by way of kind of a resolution. And so I would probably 
uh, recommend doing a resolution. So going forward, I would imagine we would probably have a study session at some point with our Arts, Arts and Culture Commission so they can give a little bit more information in terms of the recommendation that you saw in terms of those percentages. You'd be able to get some information regarding the finances and the potential uses and then Council would provide direction through a resolution as to how you would like to spend those funds for either, you know, 2023 calendar year or, you know, that can be refined pretty quickly over time if there were changes in conditions in the market. Would, would that be something that would be annual basis or just guideline? Because I want, I'm, I'm just looking for more flexibility. Like if one year we want to spend 50% on marketing or I, I don't know what it is, but. Yeah, I, you know, I would defer to Jim, but I, I would say it would probably be an annual basis okay. where we would come back to council and report on. Um, how the use of those funds has has worked? Okay. I, I would offer, Mayor, that uh, this could work. I think in in, in terms. It's on. It's on. I can it's on. Yeah, yeah. Don't in listen terms to of right. some study session, uh, it could look a lot like the uh, Measure Three A discussions about the uh, capital strategy, where okay. where council had and will continue to have conversations about categories and how much of the revenue to allocate per category. Um, I, I think that's a similar process that the council might undertake to, to kind of have an ongoing allocation and change as <laughs> is necessary. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions? No questions, all right, so it is 926 and I'm gonna open the public hearing for item C, Ordinance 15 2022 here. Uh, we've got a handful of people signed up for it. Uh, first up is Denise Weed. Right, yeah, and the yeah, what we'll, we're doing is to refer this to the ballot, so. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. My name is Denise Weed, and I live in District 2, and I'm here tonight to speak in favor of the lodging tax. When arts and culture are a part of the core fabric of a community, it helps cities to attract tourists, diverse talent, it brings about innovation, and it does grow the economy. From citizens, individual artists, cultural organizations to businesses and even government leadership, everybody in this ecosystem benefits from the arts. These are all reasons that I support the lodging tax, but to be honest, I have a little bit more of a selfish reason, and that's my two children. I have a son going into fifth grade and a daughter going into second grade um, tomorrow, in fact. <laughs> and. Um, I really want them to grow up in a community that values and supports the arts. It's really important to me. At a fundamental level, cultural and aesthetic experiences shape us as human beings. It strengthens our ability to learn and elevates us as a democratic group of citizens. Art engages children's senses and it supports the development of cognitive, social, emotional, and multi-sensory skills. The arts challenge us it challenges us with different points of view. It compels us to be empathetic, and it gives us the opportunity to reflect on the human condition. The lodging tax and all of the ways that it would help support the arts and culture in our community is so important to us all. It's important to the children in our com community, the youth, um, but not just my children, to all of our children. Marcel Duchamp said, what art is, in reality, is the missing link. Not the links which exist, it's not what you see that is art, because art is the gap. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you, Denise. Kate Eckel. We'll drop it way down. <laughs> Good evening, City Council, fellow residents of Littleton. My name is Kate Uckle and I live in District 2. I ask that the City Council approve the ordinance to submit the question to voters to approve a lodger's tax with revenue supporting arts and culture, tourism, and visitor promotion. Here are the reasons why I feel that this is vitally important for our community. According to the statistics from Americans in the Arts, nationally, the nonprofit arts and culture industry generated over 100 and 66 billion of economic activity. 63 billion in spending by arts and cultural organizations, an additional 102 billion in event-related expenditures by their audiences. This activity supported four million jobs and generated 27 billion in revenue to local, state, and federal governments. Arts and culture 
organizations are valued members of the business community. They employ people locally, purchase goods and services from within the community, are members of their chambers of commerce, and promote their regions. By promoting arts, culture, and tourism, we will be bringing more people in to visit our events and city and spending their dollars with us, which will give us more dollars to use to improve the lives of our citizens. Here's what Littleton already has. Live theater through the Town Hall Arts Center. Education in design and fine arts through Arapahoe Community College. Littleton Symphony Orchestra. Voices West, a choral group. A museum that is part of the prestigious Smithsonian Affiliates Program and offers multiple art shows, interactive art events, interactive historical events and concerts. A first right library that offers incredible learning opportunities and programming to Littleton residents. Colleen. City clerk will be in order. The city clerk will be in order. You. And Colleen. I, apo I apologize on behalf of the city, I get, Kate. I get like 25 more seconds. Fine art galleries. The architectural history of Littleton with nationally recognized mid-century modern architecture. The Littleton Ballet Academy, the Littleton Depot, Hudson Gardens, and individual artists and artisans. If my fellow citizens have not participated in one of these arts and culture events, I urge you to do so. It is lovely to listen to wonderful music in the fresh air of one of our parks while the sun sets over the Colorado mountains, to be gleefully entertained while talented actors sing and dance on stage, to wander one of the quiet galleries in our own museum, or to read a community book through Littleton's One Book, One Littleton program or walk one of our historical tours. There is literally something for everyone from an arts and culture perspective. The possibility of arts and culture in our community is endless. We can afford more sculpture, attract more art galleries and artists, integrate arts from different demographics, performance and rehearsal space for multiple performing arts entities within our community. For all of these reasons, I passionately ask City Council to approve the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. You have 10 more seconds because you, 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 you were interrupted there. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Kate. Thanks. All right. Next up, uh, Tiffany Johnson. I, just can't be I see no Tiffany Johnson uh, was in favor. Pat Cronenberger. Pat Cronenberger, District 2. Uh, I support uh, this effort. Uh, in fact, I would be very supportive of going to 7% on the tax. I think this, it's always baffled me why we didn't do the lodging tax years ago. I'd be supportive of it if it were going to the general fund. I think it's a brilliant solution that it be oriented toward arts and culture in the community. I mean, we pride ourselves on small town feel, but if you read the comp plan, the small town feel has more to do with these institutions, all four of them, the big four, are what really bring us together in the community and make us feel like we're all connected. So. Um, Thank you, and I, I support the effort. Thank you. Uh, Rick Cronenberger. Rick Cronenberger, District 2. I'm on the Board of Directors for Historic Littleton, Inc. People are drawn from around the region and nationally to Littleton and to our historic downtown and its cultural heritage, and specifically the ambience that's created by the historic buildings. Preservation of historic buildings from the 1880s in the downtown to the mid-century modern architecture of Littleton Boulevard provides a stage set for Littleton's culture. Many of the art organizations are housed in historic buildings, whether designated or not. Town Hall Art Center is in our magnificent Italian Renaissance Town Hall, and the Depot Art Gallery is in our Atkinson, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad Depot. Both buildings were designated as landmarks in 1973. 49 years before Littleton had a formal preservation program. Tourists are drawn to the old and the authentic. This tourism tax will go a long way to continuing to preserve our cultural heritage and for people to continue to enjoy Littleton. Historic Littleton Inc. has been a leader in encouraging the preservation of our downtown and our historic buildings for over 30 years. We are proud to be part of the local arts and cultural organizations. It wasn't easy to get into it. Therefore, I and Historical Littleton Inc. support the Lodges tax and support the Arts and Cultures Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Michael Johnson's next. 
seeing no Michael Johnson, uh, Molly Blakely. Good evening, Council. I'm Molly Blakely. I live in District 2. I District ha 2 is in the house. Yeah. <laughs> um, I happen to be the chair of the Fine Arts Board, but I am here as a private citizen. Um, I'm also an architect, and I am fully in support of putting the ballot question um, to the voters to put a lodger's tax um, out there as, you know, a, having my family have fun and cool things to do in downtown Littleton and bringing more people in as it just supports the arts. I think it's a fantastic idea. Again, I'm in support. Thank you. Uh, Pam Chadbourne. Um, I'm Pam Chepard. I live a block and a half from here in District 1. So um, I support the lodger's tax. always have. It's a good idea. Um, it puts us in parity with all the surrounding communities. Again, we could have had it much earlier, and um, it would have been great. Um, and I'm really happy that you included STRs in being taxed. Um, they totally are short-term rentals. They're uh, parity with hotels and motels. I don't want to penalize hotels and motels uh, to favor short-term rentals. This is a good thing to do. Um, I have two concerns. I would like the language to specifically include historic preservation. And let me give you an idea. Um, the Raft Street Mill is degrading. Um, it is, it was, in our old design standards and guidelines, one of the uh, two benchmarks for heights in downtown. And it defines the area from all around when you're in a car approaching the city. Uh, we need funds, I think, to incentivize and support and sustain that building. Uh, and I think the lodging tax ought to be a place where historic preservation can get some money when needed. So I'd like to see flexibility in the language to support architectural restoration of historic assets and historic assets and historic preservation specifically. And the second item I want to see allowed by the language is some kind of tourist bus or circulator bus. And it would go from hotels to light rail or bus stations. And obviously from County Line Road, if you're coming to visit from the airport and you take the light rail and go up the you know, you've got a gap to get to those hotels. If you had a circulator bus, it would get you from one to the other. I've been in city after city. If you travel for work, that these are often offered. And then you wouldn't have to rent a car because you could hop the circulator bus after you're done for the day and uh, online or whatever you're doing or going to Martin Marietta with folks who are bringing you. And the circulator bus would get you to downtown and then they could enjoy downtown. You know, we have a new hotel here over in Bellevue, and then they could be able to get to light rail and stuff. So uh, the circulator bus, in addition, adds a huge amount to the city. Um, it is a small business booster like you wouldn't believe, because people anywhere from high school, from work, you, you can park up at Woodlawn, hop in the bus, and get down to, because I think it would, should go up and down Littleton Boulevard, um, get down to, to downtown and then get back to your car parked at Woodlawn. It is so uh, enabling for so many things in the city. So I'd like the language to include um, historic preservation and a circulator bus. Thanks. Thank you, Pam. Uh, and last on the sign up list is Emily Abel. Is Emily here? Nope. Anybody else wish to speak on this? I think Paul got his hand up before you this time, Frank. Yes, he did. Come on, Paul. <laughs> Good evening, Council. Um, <clears throat> this is a great idea. This has been floating around here for 10 or 15 years, ever since Tom Mulvey first started talking about it. And it's time to get on with it and do it. Um, I'd probably agree with Pat Cronenberger, maybe even more than 5%. Um, anyway, the places where it's going to go and the whole shebang 
you're laughing because I'm agreeing with Pat Cronenberg. <laughs> That's never happened before. <laughs> anyway, it's a great idea. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. All right, Frank. Good evening, Reed. Good evening, Mayor and City Council and citizens. Uh, what I'd like to do is go down the road of transparency, accountability, and consequences. And in the same way that the capital improvement sales tax had a citizen committee and charter to uh, check on it, or transparency, accountability, and consequences, I would like uh, this sales tax, lodger's tax, that's intended to support arts, culture, tourism, perhaps historical uh, sites, and um, a, tr a um, shuttle bus, to also have a citizen committee and charter to um, minimize uh, commingling of funds and to be certain that uh, funding uh, doesn't uh, get lost in the general uh, general account. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? Please come down. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is J.D. McCrum, and you will never guess which district I live in. <laughs> My family and I treasure the arts. We participate in it uh, in the various forms that were listed before you tonight, weekly, um, if not in some cases, daily. I um, wanted to share with you, I'm going a little bit off script because so much has been covered, but I did want to share with you uh, in their 2020 economic activity study, the Colorado Business Committee for the Arts, which is a nonprofit dedicated towards the advancing and understanding of Colorado's creative economy and connecting businesses and arts organizations, offered the following information, and this is taking what you heard from Ms. Eckel and bringing it down to a state level. $1.5 billion in arts generated, $435 million in direct economic impact, 9,688 jobs provided, 8 million people attended or directly participated in arts programming, $225 million in philanthropic giving to the arts in the year 2020, and 2 million children reached through educational outreach. That was in 2020. Kids were at home. We were at home. And yet, we still had those staggering numbers. That was a dramatic drop from where it was pre-pandemic and where it's already coming back to. Locally, Town Hall Arts Center spends more than $100,000 locally on plywood and paint, material, and other knickknacks that we use on our stage. Uh, we estimate that 55,000 instances of our actors and patrons visit local shops and restaurants before or after they attend our classes. The arts make our communities more dynamic more sustainable and the economic benefits, the economic impacts benefit everyone, whether they participate or like something that they might find on a stage or in a gallery. The money generated through the lodger's tax will enhance the organizations and activities that have been outlined tonight for years and years to come. And if you don't think a symphony that has a $50,000 a year annual budget can do amazing things with an extra one or $2,000, you need to spend more time with the Littleton Symphony or with the Arapaho Philharmonic because they are outstanding groups. And with a little bit of a boost, I think the ceilings will be blown off their performance venue. This Lodgers tax will communicate to artists and art lovers across the state that Littleton is a place to come and be entertained, educated, and enriched, and a city that recognizes the economic vitality a strong arts culture provides for its citizens. This measure will allow current and future arts organizations to grow programming, reach a broader audience, be sustained operationally, and overall be more connected to the community. I sincerely appreciate the efforts that have gone into bringing this forward tonight. I sincerely appreciate all of your consideration of it. And I, along with a growing contingent of like-minded citizens, are very eager to share the messages that you've heard tonight with the voters of Littleton should you advance this to the ballot. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing no one, we will close the public uh, hearing. Does Council, anyone have any questions? Council Member Grove. This is probably for Reed. Um, the suggestion uh, to putting some of the money towards architectural restoration of historic assets, um, that is something we may want to consider, and we could consider that later. We have quite a bit of ARPA funds going towards um, historic preservation right now in the short run, so we may not need to do that. But the wording of the ballot would allow us some flexibility down the road. Is that correct? Yeah, I would say as, excuse me, I would say as currently written, I mean, we, the money is earmarked towards supporting arts and culture and tourism and visitor promotion. So uh, theoretically a thriving uh, historic um, downtown would help support that. So I think you could probably get there with the language. And it, since we can look at reviewing this on some with some cadence, like every year or whatever, in terms of the proportions and how we allocate it, right? So yeah, more so if you wanted to, but okay. I think it would be probably part of the, the budget. I process just wanted as well. to know if the wording allows us some flexibility down the road, and it sounds like it does. Yeah, and I'm not sure, and I'll defer to to Miss Nardi if there was any polling that was done in terms of various. I mean, if, that if, could go to if citizens think they're voting for the big four only, I, I, I don't want to, I want to be transparent, not deceiving, but if there is some flexibility. I think the ballot language indicates other arts organizations. Those four are mentioned, but it also talks about others. And if you take a look at something like Historic Littleton Inc. that Mr. Cronenberger spoke to uh, as a nonprofit, that would be an organization supporting the culture of the community that I would think would be eligible to apply for grants. Thank you. Yeah, I, I follow up on that. I had the exact same question. I just wanted to make sure the ballot language did not restrict the use of funds towards those. I mean, seeing tourism, visitor promotion, culture, the way I read it, it would because I agree 100% with the uh, Ms. Chaborn for putting funds towards that um, during the rulemaking process. And so as long as the ballot language doesn't preclude that, preclude that, I just wanted to mention the city manager, let's make sure when we, if this passes uh, the voters that it, um, we have that discussion about the the i, I believe it does have language that says such as okay the, the not only attorney's favorite two words <laughs> hence two <four>. allegedly <laughs> all right any other questions uh council member driscoll yeah let it be noted that i agree with everybody that stood up and spoke to this including pam and frank <laughs> <laughs> first time and, He'll and, be available and, for hugs in the hall after. <laughs> and for those people that are listening to this, uh, this is not a tax on you. This is a tax on people coming to stay in our lodging, our lodges, our hotels. Um, I, I, I just want to make sure people were clear on that. I, thanks. Great. If there's no more questions, I'll entertain a motion from someone. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a no. motion <laughs> to... <laughs> <laughs> to approve ordinance 15-2022 an ordinance on second reading submitted to the registered electors of the city of Littleton, Colorado, a ballot question regarding lodgers taxes, support arts, culture, and tourism, and other stuff too. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve ordinance 15 of 2022. Um, any further discussion or comments? Anyone? I'd like to comment. Mayor Pro Tem? Yeah, so um, fun fact everybody. I don't usually brag about this, but I was a history major in college. It's pretty useless to be in the workforce, um, but I did learn one, one thing, and that's history repeats itself. And you know, following the 1918 flu pandemic, we entered the Roaring Twenties, and that was advancements in art and food and fashion and literature. Um, and now I think 100 years, late, 100 years later, we're kind of in that post-pandemic, right, knock on wood, um, era, and I think we're positioned to follow suit. So I want to make sure Littleton has the dedicated resources, specifically this tax, to continue to be a cultural hub of that sort of roaring excellence. Uh, we learned from Mr. McCrum tonight that we know that investment in arts creates jobs, it creates ec further economic activity, especially to our businesses. And we also learned from Ms. Eckel, who highlighted several of the different art and culture entities that we have in Littleton, 
how varied and diverse they are. Um, she and Mr. McCrum also mentioned the Littleton Symphony. They actually rehearsed at a church across the street from my apartment. And last night, I had my windows open because it was you know, raining, and, and I could hear them rehearsing. And spoiler alert, they're doing Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, um, which was really fun. Um, but that, to me, when I hear that coming from my windows on a random Monday night, that is community character. So I'm going to be supporting this ballot initiative. Councilmember Barr, did you have something? Yeah, just real quick, because we have a captured audience of some of the business community here as well, um, I just want to make a shout out to you all that it's this, uh, you know, when we take this vote in, uh, hopefully we get this on the ballot, um, we're going to be looking to the business community to help us advocate for and support this as well. Um, because, you know, the health of our businesses and the health of our arts and culture and tourism are, are intrinsically linked. So, um, you know, we would just like to make that humble request to you all, too, uh, when you're out there promoting, you know, hopefully your DD, the DDA as well, uh, to speak up about the lodger's tax and speak about our arts and culture. So thank you all. Councilmember Valdez. Uh, just to piggyback on uh, Mayor Pro Tem's comment, on Friday nights I love the sound of the crowd and the drums coming from Littleton Football Stadium. <laughs> so, cool. Uh, th th uh, yesterday, or Sunday I guess it is, uh, I was up in Loveland at an art uh, event up there and there were hundreds upon hundreds of people up there. And that was just one day. So, and it was a several day comp uh, event. So I'm going to support this. Anyone else? I'll just chime in, you know, as one of the things that we hear from the community is, you know, supporting of these assets, the, the museum, the library, things like that. And that's, as one uh, citizen said, that these are the backbones of that idea of what a small town feels here in Littleton. So I think it's important supporting that. And I just want to um, uh, make clear that we're voting to send this to the ballot. We're not voting to actually just put it on there because it's a Tabor question. So whether we support it or not, I think we all support it in generally, but we're supporting to put it on the ballot for the citizens to uh, approve or not approve. Okay. With that, uh, we have a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 15. I will figure out how to vote here. I'm, do I second? I haven't gotten to it yet, so okay. I'm still. Wait, on you, Gretchen. Gretchen. No, just vote. Oh, sorry. Vote at least once. <laughs> Rookie. Rookie. <clears throat> the vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. All right, great. Um, as we are approaching the 10 o'clock hour, we need to have formal action continue. We do have two more items on the agenda. So, Councilmember Valdez, will you read them? Uh, Mayor, I move that we. Uh, continue our, move, our meeting past 10 o'clock in order to get these two items off our books. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Um, uh, going past 10 o'clock, uh, I've got to get this off of here. All right. Pat, there we go. Rookie. The vote is seven in favor. The motion to continue past 10 o'clock carries unanimously. Okay. Um, we have two more items. Does anyone need a break or you want to push through? Push, push through. Okay, great. Um, next up is item D, Ordinance 16, 2022, an ordinance on second reading submitting to the registered and qualified electors within the defined boundaries of the proposed Downtown Development Authority, the DDA, a ballot question regarding the creation of a DDA the collection of all revenues, and the increase in property taxes. Uh, so we will have a, a staff presentation. We can ask questions. We'll open the public hearing. Public can come comment. We have uh, about uh, 20 or so people signed up. Um, and then we can ask questions, and we'll have a motion. And we can vote on it. So city manager. Thank you, Mayor. For this item, I will look to our community services director, Kathleen Osher, for an overview of the ballot measure. Good evening, Mayor and members of Council. Before you tonight is the question of does Council support placing three questions on the November 8th ballot related to the DDA to qualified electors within the defined boundaries. Those three questions include the formation of the DDA, the collection and retaining and expending the full amount of revenues received by the authority, 
And then lastly, an increase in property tax, no more than three mills to support operations of and services provided by the DDA. Prior actions and discussions for this item have included uh, stakeholders approaching the city in 2021 uh, to really talk about tools to help the downtown stay vibrant. And with council's support and participation of council member Driscoll, we launched a study to determine the feasibility of a downtown district. Um, with updates in both April and June and an incorporation of this into your community research and engagement project um, with results from the benchmark survey presented in July. And this is all part of goal four, downtown objective one partnerships of council's work plan, which was both uh, discussed earlier this year and then adopted in May. The engagement results uh, a combination of both the stakeholders meeting monthly, a downtown survey that was completed with 800 respondents. Um, results identified five areas for improvement, which have been incorporated into um, both drafts that have been presented to council, and then the community research and engagement polling results indicating um, the, the things that have already been mentioned this evening, Littleton on the right track, approval for the Littleton city government and satisfaction with the value that people receive in terms of taxes paid. Uh, just to remind you of a couple of things, there is an ongoing role for city council to appoint the membership of the DDA board and any future vacancies, a five-year plan of development, which again, that is the project plan um, with detailed activities, programs, improvements, and any future changes would come before council. There is a mayoral appointment of a council member to serve on the DDA board, and then you would continue to direct city staff to both coordinate and work with the DDA board as well as their staff. And another reminder, qualified electors is something that is incorporated into this ballot language. Again, that is renters, or that is residents, landowners, leasees within the boundaries of the proposed DDA. Um, and then landowners and leasees who are persons are qualified electors. Entities such as LLCs or corporations um, may vote by designating a person to vote on their behalf, but it is important to remember one person, one vote. So even if a person or entity can be qualified as an elector under a different category, they may only vote once. And you were given an example as part of the packet this evening. The ballot details, again, include three questions. The formation of a downtown development authority with the boundaries outlined in that legal description included. Um, the opportunity to collect, retain, and expend the full amount of revenues received by the authority. And lastly, that increase in property tax by no more than three mills to support the operations and services provided by the DDA. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions, Council? Councilmember Grove. Uh, there's, my understanding is there's rules and regulations about how council selects um, members of the DDA. Is that true? Uh, the, what we've incorporated into that is the idea that the DDA um, stakeholders uh, that have been working through this committee would present you with a slate and then council could consider that slate if uh, if council would like to see additional options that would go back to that set of stakeholders to bring a slate for the initial board and then in future when there is a vacancy um, the DDA board would offer you a slate of if there's one vacancy I think they'd probably offer you a slate of three candidates to consider for that opening and um, so if and there would be there so would be a process that the DDA would go through to accept applications for any vacancies. And would we forward. have input into that process? Into the which process? process? For, selecting, uh, for collecting applicants? I think that the application process would be one that the, the DDA would basically advertise a vacancy on the board, take applications, uh, do a series of interviews is what we've talked about, and then they would bring back that slate of three potential candidates to fill any one vacancy for council. So if you wanted to get on the board initially or as a vacancy, you would have to make sure that you're on the slate. So you ha council doesn't have first right of refusal, so to speak, the, the um, 
board or the steering committee or whatever would. Is that what you're saying? Right, the, the, the full slate would be presented to council. And I'm sorry, I, I think Councilman Groves asking, we would uh, not see all the applicants, but just the slate, or would we see all the applicants and then the slate would be more of just recommendations from? Yeah, at this point, what we've talked about with the DDA stakeholders is that those, uh, that slate would be advanced to council. I'm sure that there is an opportunity to see that full list of applicants if council so and, desired. And is this process not defined in the ballot here, but in the future, if this, assuming this would this would be defined as part of the plan of development after any, right exactly. Okay. So if if the measure were successful with uh, qualified electors, then the that um, the plan of development would be presented for consideration by council and would outline all of the specifics. And then council would have. So input. then it would be open for discussion at a later date. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Valdez. Thank you. Uh, for our city attorney, th I presume this is controlled by state law anyway. It's, it's not like we're going to be making up rules as we go. This is controlled by state law. Correct. That's the shortest answer you've ever given me. <laughs> <laughs> Remember this moment. Um, any other questions from, from council? <laughs> All right, seeing no other questions, I'm going to open the public hearing at 10 o'clock on the dot. Uh, first up is Megan Casey. She left. No, not here. Was in favor. Todd Lang. Good evening. I appreciate your time. Uh, my name is Todd Lang. I'm a business owner in downtown Littleton. Uh, we rent space in uh, the little town office building, and I'm an LPS kid, uh, K through 12 as well. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, <laughs> uh, I believe the DDA will pass. I'm in favor of the DDA. I think it's going to help the city uh, in the beautification process of it. I think it will be something that will help the, uh, with the maintenance of the city, and I think it will increase uh, mm -hmm. the ongoing safety concerns that the city is going through right now. Um, a concern that I do have is funding going forward. I think a collaboration with the residents, the renters, uh, the business owners and the city all working symbi symbiotically, I think will go a long way uh, to help with uh, uh, some of the safety issues. Um, and that's, uh, I appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Catherine Huey. Hi. Good late evening, <laughs> members of the City Council. Thank you so much for your time and attention to the, develop the Downtown Development Authority. Um, my name is Katerina Huey. I am the Executive Director and owner of Dirt Coffee, a nonprofit social enterprise <clears throat> whose coffee house and programming operates in downtown Denver off of Rapp Street. Our mission is to train, employ, and empower neurodivergent adults in the workforce and transform hiring practices. So as a business owner and a community advocate, I am in support of the DDA. Um, I want to say that I have been a small local business owner for about a year and a half here in downtown Littleton. I also live eight minutes away from the downtown Littleton. And I feel that I navigate as an employer, as a consumer, and as a consultant to down, uh, downtown Littleton businesses as well. And I think that there is um, personally felt an, a, an economic anxiety that we're feeling. And so I feel like the DDA is a step in the right direction to ensuring that stakeholders along with the city can address how we want to promote downtown Littleton and the investments that we want to bring in from you know more artist events to being able to really have um, a partnership with residents tenants property owners and business owners um, the DDA I think has an opportunity as well for us to have more focus on the downtown Littleton area you know we've heard a lot tonight about how Littleton is growing and the city it's becoming but I think that the downtown is the charm and the heart of Littleton and keeps that small town feel that everybody comes to love and enjoy so um, kind of coming together in a focus to protect that 
uh, I think is essential. And then I will say that I love showing off downtown Littleton to my friends, to my family, to visitors, and I um, look forward to working with our stakeholders downtown, with the city, and ensuring that this ballot initiative will be welcome and appreciated efforts by our voters this fall. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jill Swank. Hello, my name is Jill Swank. I work at 2329 Main Street and I have two young kids in the Littleton public school system. Um, I feel that downtown Littleton has a lot of potential and I really look forward to the improvements um, to the shopper experience for the area. Um, as a mom of kids, I feel that the current environment is not ideal right now for young families and I would love to see improvements to the pedestrian areas and safety. Um, working in downtown Littleton, we've seen vandalism in buildings, um, offices broken into, um, and locks on bathrooms. And I would fully support the DDA to guide improvements in these areas. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Corey Lundock? I was just told not to talk too much, so. <laughs> Follow that Trust advice. Trust me, I will try to keep it short. I am here in full support of the Downtown Development Authority and have been on the steering committee for probably close to two years at least. So we've put a lot of time and thought into bringing this to council and hoping to take this to ballot. Um, I am a third generation Littleton. Uh, my grandparents were developers here in Littleton. They built Woodlawn and many of the buildings you still see along Littleton Boulevard. My dad has owned, uh, my family has owned Columbine Ambulance. Um, across from ACC for 60 years. So I have been in downtown Littleton my entire life. I currently work at Redstone Bank just across the street here. Um, I feel that a DDA would really support the existing um, businesses and help in bringing in small business. I have worked with um, the historic downtown Littleton merchants for the last 20 years and have um, been involved with the Littleton Business Chamber, the Littleton Rotary, and the Littleton Elks Lodge. Um, Coming up, so pretty busy in the community and I'm down in downtown Littleton every day and see a lot of what's going on. I would appreciate if council would provide um, the opportunity to the stakeholders to really go to the residents and the business and um, try to pro provide uh, local control and focus attention to where it is needed here in downtown Littleton. Thank you. Thank you. A minute and 20 seconds. Was that short enough for whoever told you? <laughs> All right, Rich Patron. Three minutes, my wife says there's no way. Anyway, um, hey, thanks for having us here today. And I just want to know, uh, my name is Rich Patron. I live in Littleton at 1950 uh, uh, South Littleton Boulevard, where they mentioned it today. It's kind of scared me a little bit when I heard that come up. But anyway, then also um, I have my business in Littleton in the Littletown building also. So anyway, I just want to say Littleton's cool. I've been in my business out here about 12 years ago. I mean, I've lived around here forever, but I mean, we had actually the business down here, our real estate office, and it's just so awesome. And, you know, we bring my grandkids in the office a lot, and we hang out, and the kids just love it. And we had our little dog we used to walk around, but it's just little to this cool thing. And now that I live so close, I could walk to work, and I, will, I come over that bridge, and you see the mountains up there and everything. It's just so beautiful, and the town is so cool. It's like a diamond in the rough, though. It needs to be upgraded, and I really support the DDA because it needs a lot of little TLC right now, I guess we say in our business, you know. But it's just a cool little town, and we got a unique situation here with a Main Street. There's not much of that around, you know. So let's take care of it, and I support this 100%, and hopefully you all get it on that ballot. Thanks. Thank you. David Law. Mr. Mayor, City Council, David Law, Miller and Law. Good to see everybody tonight. Feels like a marathon tonight, doesn't it? It's actually a marathon that actually brought this before you here tonight. A lot of effort by a lot of people. I fully support the DDA, and I'm going to ask you to do so too. Much of what I could say would be cumulative to what you already know, and I don't want to belabor this point because I don't think there's a point in really doing that. You get it. You've seen it. You've heard it. Let's do this. Vote in favor, please. Thank you. Spoken like an attorney. Uh, John Gherkin. 
Okay. So no, John Gherkin uh, was in favor. Alexis Drennan. <laughs> Hello, I am Alexis Drennan. I co-own Willow and Tulare in downtown Littleton on Main Street. Um, it's a fun little shop, come by and see us. I also coordinate with my business partner, um, Second Saturdays, uh, which is an artisan market on Main Street that we've been, we started last year during weekends on Main and then we are continuing this year, so that's been good, and it'll be in September and October. Um, I have really enjoyed downtown Littleton for many years as a customer, a visitor. And when I had the opportunity to bring my business down here in 2020, I was like beyond excited. <laughs> my husband really had to hear about that. Um, I just felt like it was such a huge opportunity. My business was up in Wheat Ridge before that, which um, all good things to Wheat Ridge, but Downtown Littleton is just a gem in the South Metro. I think there's nothing like it. You know, it's, you really have to travel. And so I, to see it thriving already, and it's already like this incredible tourist destination as well. So every, probably every week I'm having the conversation with a customer about how can I, fit this piece of pottery in my bag. Could I like, could you wrap it really good with bubble wrap? And I need a postcard, I need a t-shirt. So we're seeing so many like friends and family of people in the, in the entire South Metro coming to downtown Littleton already. But those of us that are down here every day, we know what, what it needs as well. You know, things that are outdated, things that are damage, things that need repair. And in addition, like the possibilities, which I think everyone is excited and has talked about, but um, that's why I'm in support of the DDA, and I just think it'll be um, a great thing moving forward for many, many years. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Carl Buritz? Not here. I was in favor. Uh, Vic uh, Collider? Hi, my name is Vic Callender. I live in Englewood. I don't own a business in Littleton, and I don't own any property in downtown Littleton. So I don't have a dog in this fight. But I have been a banker on Main Street for more than 10 years, and a lot of the merchants on Main Street have become friends and customers of mine, and I'm in full support of the DDA. Um, the city is dated and needs a facelift and, some mul and multiple improvements. I think the DDA will provide the resources needed to make these improvements and the DDA will also be a valuable tool to create more inviting environment to both new and new businesses and the public. With the council support, we can make this happen and get the DDA approved this fall. Thanks. Thank you. Greg Renke. I wore my suit. <laughs> Greg Renke, 5663. The DDA, actually I've been working on it for about five years now. And I've talked to hundreds of people. What people don't understand is where we've come from. When I first moved my business down here in 1999, you could lease Main Street for $3 a square foot. And no one was making money. Jim Campbell and I had lunch at Abe's Cafe on a June, on a Wednesday, and we were the only ones down there eating on all of Main Street. Nobody was there. I looked at Jim and said, we need to do something. And if we don't do something, this is going to fail down here, and they'll tear it down. And he said, what would you do? I said, let's just do a concert up on a roof. And so above T's, it was Larry's Golf Shop, if you remember back in the day, and we did the Whoopi Cushion Rooftop Concerts. And every Wednesday, we would drag a band up there to play all the merchants. And by the way, to be part of the Merchant Association was $15 a year. We had 10 merchants in it. Bring it up to date where we are today. Events have made this town happen, along with historic preservation and all the things we've done. We've made what Disney spent a billion dollars trying to make, and that's Main Street USA, and our forefathers built it. The problem we have now is COVID, and I've been the uh, president of the Merchant Association for about 14 years now, has destroyed it. We had over 100 merchants at one point, and now we have 30. This DDA is our financial future. The other problem that we have, to start rebuilding these events, we're gonna to have to start from scratch, and I'm 62 years old. <laughs> I'm not gonna be here that much longer. This DDA will guarantee 
there's a replacement for all the board of directors for the Merchant Association, and it'll continue for at least another 30 years. And this will help finance the block party, the turkey leg and wine hoedown, the wig mania, the zombie crawl and pig roast, and all the other grainy, crazy zany things that we do, along with the Criterium and Western Welcome Week. This is our future. The nice thing is it'll be a financial future. And I want to also talk just for a second about um, the mill levy, because that's going to be the hardest thing to get a vote on. I want everybody to understand, because I've, I've had people tell me that we've cut out residences because we don't want their, their, to talk to us about it or not to have a, a say-so. That's not true. These property owners, we're going to tax ourselves, and that seems kind of crazy. But the reason we've cut it and cookie cut a lot of the residents out is we don't want to raise their property tax. We'll raise our own. And therefore, the businesses will pay for whatever we decide to build, whether it's an amphitheater or a parking garage. But we'll put that in place when we actually have a plan. But if we have Th that you, financial part of it, Greg. when it comes time, we can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn Christensen. I don't think she's here anymore. Um, did not say yes or no. Uh, Carol Alvarez. Thank you for extending past 10 o'clock. It's late for all of us. I'm Carol Alvarez. I'm the owner of NT. I'm on Main Street in downtown Littleton. Um, I opened my business in 2008 and moved to Main Street in 2013. And um, I love being in downtown Littleton, but there are some challenges. And I'm gonna go through seven things that I deal with on pretty much a daily or weekly basis that I really think the DDA um, could help alleviate so that I could just keep making tea. Um, first of all, parking. I have 15 employees, five of which are in my premises at all times, and we have one parking space. Accommodations, I have elderly and disabled customers. It'd be great to have loading zones so people could drop off family members and then go park their cars. Beautification, I have purchased my own huge flower pot that I have put in the front of my shop <laughs> filled with flowers. We water it with tea every day, but it would be so great to have some consistency in the beautification of Main Street. Um, the loose rock planters around the trees are so annoying, and I am sweeping that loose gravel pretty much every day and hoping that no one slips on their way into our shop. Um, the snow shoveling, I make sure that my area is clear. There is a business to the east of me, not town hall, but to the east of me that is not so good about shoveling. And so then I am left with the quandary, do I shovel for them? Keep my customers safe? Do I leave it for them to reap the consequences? So having some consistent snow shoveling and snow removal would be awesome. Security presence. Um, in the years I've been downtown, my blade sign has been vandalized three times, one time totally destroyed. My um, outdoor heaters have been knocked over so many times, um, once during business. So having a greater security presence, I think, would be really warranted. Um, and it may seem inconsequential, but all these things add up. Um, and as far as the events go, I think looking from a different perspective, from the inside out, my employees love the events. And that helps me keep them motivated to keep my staff going. So the events serve more than just a purpose for the outside community. It helps, um, it helps me maintain my labor force. So, okay, I think we know what we need to do. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Uh, Jane Barth. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Janie Barth, own Jake's, and part of the building there. So I've been a, a business owner for 14 years in downtown Littleton. I'm going to start with two concerns. My first is 
that the trees, many of the trees were not uh, replanted on Main Street. There's nothing more charming than the trees on Main Street. And the reason was they didn't last 20 years. That was really bothersome. The second one is, I have to say, I love our police department. They are amazing. I think they do a spectacular job. About a month ago, though, I was sitting out in front of Jake's on the patio from about 6.30 to about 8.30. And in that period of time, I saw at least a half a dozen cars and motorcycles go from Prince down to View House at over 40, 45 miles an hour, hot riding. I don't see the police presence I used to, and that concerns me. I realize that the city council has a big area to take care of. Littleton is huge. But the merchants downtown are there every day. They're seeing what happens. And so by allowing them to have more responsibility and more funds to take care of some of these issues, like the landscaping, like the snow shoveling, I think would be very, very helpful. Hoodlum does a great job of all the wonderful events, but we need to have more than events. We need to have the community down there that's, that we're seeing the problems and that we have the funds to correct it. Vega Park needs to be more open, have farmers markets, concerts, arts and crafts fairs, up and down the street, us being able to work together to make a more vibrant downtown, I think is what we're all looking for. And so I can tell you, I definitely support the DDA. Thank you. Thank you. Robin Bernstein? Well, well let's get through the uh, list of people. You come up. Uh, Robin was listed as no. Uh, Molly Blakely? I will keep this brief. I'm Molly Blakely from District 2, and I fully support putting, putting this measure on the ballot. I think it's a great idea to because Littleton has unique opportunities and unique challenges, and it this will create the authority to be able to deal with those challenges. I support. Thank you. Thank you. And then the last person signed up, Pam Chadbourne. So, Council, I'm going to ask you to uh, put this on the ballot for November 2023, and in the intervening year, I'd like you to study how staff figure this out from the city's point of view. This sounds wonderful, and I'm really engaged and excited by a few of the speakers I heard. I'm also going to say I'm really grateful for the merchants, and I support the small businesses. It is, it is something we've got to keep in support. But None of the work that the city performed was from the city's point of view. And I'm sorry, Council, you've got to assure that this works for the city. We should have had a financial report. So let's estimate how many taxes are being diverted over time. You, you can estimate all this stuff, create some scenarios, and see if it's succeeding, medium, or failing. And then let's also have economic development do a few scenarios. Uh, give us some guardrails over time. When do we pay attention to, hey, this is getting close to one marker or indicator that it's not working and we really need to pay attention to something? Um, I need to know that this is going to work for the city. I'm going to The other thing I have to bring up before I run out of time, is the boundaries. There is absolutely no reason for these boundaries. It is extraordinary, the proposal that is in the boundaries. Council, if you want, you could say reduce the boundaries to Main Street. Start small, see how it works, and expand. But it is extraordinarily bizarre that dish is included, open space is included, uh, government property, both for the city and Arapahoe County, is included. I think there is more non-commercial, non-retail property in this than there is retail property. It's outrageous, the boundaries. There is something else behind this boundary map. Um, it should not be approved in this condition. 
the city needs to look at the boundaries from the city's point of view and try to evaluate what is the best mix of properties for the initial taxes. It should not come from the people who are in the steering committee. Um, council, you have a goal for downtown, and it's really important that we preserve that and protect it. I'm, there's no connection between this enthusiasm and achieving that. Having a DDA does not guarantee that suddenly we maintain downtown. There's, we've got to see that concept bef before that's approved. But you also have a goal of good governance. And your good governance is for the city. You must assure that this works financially and economically for the city and that the boundaries won't destroy us. You know, 30 years ago, the Riverfront Authority failed. Uh, taxes and bonding can get the city in trouble for 20 years. It dragged us down. Thank you, Pam. That's your time. So, Council, please do your job for the city. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak? Oh, behind you, Frank. She's first. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Jody Krause and I live in District 1. And I have questions about the boundary that Pam was speaking of. Here it is, the map. So when I think of downtown Littleton, I think of this little area here. I mean, Main Street is four blocks long. According to this map and boundaries, we have the Downtown District Development Authority coming clear out here past ACC, I guess that's south, across Santa Fe, including Dish, like Pam was referring to, all the way down, just this line, just north of Hudson Gardens. What is, is this downtown Littleton? Up here, you've got it going way up to the county buildings, past the county administrative buildings, and then you cross over, and this little, ship-looking thing down Littleton Boulevard. Why are the boundaries not closer down, just around little downtown Littleton? Also, I'd like to also say, like Pam said, the risk. The risk of defaulting on their bonds. Is that going to fall back on the city? They need to do more work on a financial assessment. What's it going to look like? This is needs to be explained. And they took this little chunk out here. And the gentleman said it's because they didn't want these people to incur the tax increase. Not so sure about that. Thank you. Thank you. Paul and then Frank. Good evening, Council. <clears throat> Paul Bingham, 236 West Delaware Circle. <clears throat> I've watched Greg Grinke and the hoodlums downtown and do their magic for a long time. I've gone to hoodlum meetings off and on for, for years, and this is a natural outgrowth of what they've been doing down there. Um, and now here the, the LBC has come along and they've kind of merged into a, <clears throat> a real organization down there. I think this DDA, I've watched, I've watched it spout from an idea into a bunch of thought and I think a well thought through program. Um, I really see this as being a real good natural outgrowth of what they've been doing down there and it's a really good thing for downtown and I don't know I don't know anything downtown I'm just a confounded citizen and uh, but I think this is going to be great and please please support it thank you Paul Greg Ranke in the hoodlum featuring the magic sounds like a band in a concert there uh, Frank Good evening, City Council. Frank Atwood in District 4. My, my concern is that I believe that this is going to be funded by tax incremental funding. 
I don't know if that's correct or not. But if we come back to, um, some of you may be old enough for the Perot quote, the devil is in the details. Who pays? Who won't get money if somebody else gets paid? And I believe it's going to be TIF money. And will this TIF money take money away from schools and parks? I don't know. I'm confident that um, if uh, Tiffany were here, she'd, she'll be able to answer this question. I think you mean if she were awake. <laughs> Will will other Stop Littleton citizens <laughs> will will other Littleton citizens' property taxes increase in order to compensate for the TIF losses that the schools and parks might incur? Again, the devil's in the details, and I look forward to the, um, the non-artsy fartsy people to research that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wish to speak? Mr. McCrum. It's not clear to me if I'm artsy fartsy or not. <laughs> I think you are. Probably. <laughs> My name is J.D. McCrum. I live in District 2. I serve on the board of Town Hall Arts Center, and I was invited about six months ago to start participating in the steering committee uh, conversations for this uh, enterprise. Um, Town Hall Arts Center was at first concerned about a DDA. We understand some of the things that it brings to the table. We understand that it uh, could lead to more and increased activities downtown, and that's wonderful unless you perform theater in a 100-year-old building with really thin windows. But through the process and through the conversations that I've been a part of, I've come to appreciate that the collaborative nature, the willingness to reach out to all of the different constituencies that uh, may have an interest and impact has been a priority for this group and for that steering committee. I recognize that uh, has been shared. Downtown Littleton is a rarity in Colorado and across this nation, and it needs to be preserved and it needs to be enhanced. And while the city council and the city staff have always done a tremendous job with that space, the opportunity for laser-like focus on a you know few block area can only be a good thing. The opportunity to bring in more restaurants and more shops and more arts venues is a good thing. It's a good thing for Town Hall Arts Center, and I believe it's a good thing for Littleton. And so for those reasons and many, many more, I do support this moving forward and, and having an opportunity to put it on the ballot and further educate all of the people that have concerns and uh, let that play out in November. But I think that this process is good, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I see... Two more hands. Mr. Dunahay, you were first. Just, hi, Pat Dunahay, Colleen, good to see you. Uh, I live in District 4 and work in uh, District 3. And I, I just want to say we're going to have a, um, a booth at Western Welcome this uh, weekend, and we can answer anybody's technical questions, including stuff like TIFF and who's not getting money and who is and whatever other concerns any of you council members may have or the community may have. This is just our first outreach if you approve this tonight. If you don't approve this tonight, obviously we're going to keep quiet and there won't be any conversations about a DDA and that's why there hasn't been any so far if anybody thinks that we haven't adhered to a policy of openness we 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 haven't felt that we can until you tell us it's okay to go ahead thank you thank you I'm back come down to the mic please The people still watching at home will have no no idea who you are if you're back there. Hi there. Uh, I'm Sterling Oldemeyer. Up, up to the mic, thanks. Yep, sorry. Uh, I'm Sterling Oldemeyer, and um, I've lived in the Littleton community f for my entire life. And I know many of the uh, business owners who are here today in support of the uh, DDA. And uh, I, too, am in support of the DDA. And I remember a time back in the day when the family bar still existed. And, 
we had Jose's and all those fun things that no longer really are there. Um, but uh, it was really difficult moving back to Littleton after college because there wasn't really much going back. And that was uh, in 2008, for all of you to know. Um, uh, Greg was kind of just getting some of these things rolling with the uh, turkey leg and wine hoedown. And uh, as a young person moving back without very much money in my pocket, uh, I'd have to say that a lot of the events that the downtown Littleton uh, businesses or the Merchants Guild um, uh, put on throughout the year really was like a lifeline socially and kind of actually able to go and enjoy uh, some activities and get familiarized with the community again after college um, without having to spend a lot of money because I mean going to a bar is quite expensive but if you have a concert out in the street <laughs> it's a nice way to go and meet people and be a part of the community so I think that um, fostering those uh, community uh, opportunities is really important and that goes to the beautification, that goes to putting on the events and just making sure that downtown Littleton is the, the gem that we like to enjoy on a daily basis. So I'm definitely in support of the DDA. So thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? Seeing no hands up, I'm going to close the uh, public comment at 1035. Uh, does council have any questions to ask staff based on that? I just had um, one quick question after to um, Ms. Osher about the, uh, the ballots. Is this going to be on the same ballot as everything else, or is this a separate ballot so people within the boundaries will receive or if they're registered voters in Littleton, we'll receive two different ballots. Yeah, I might uh, uh, refer to our official election. Um, um, yeah. Thanks, Kathleen. Uh, so since we are coordinating with the county, uh, anybody who would normally receive a ballot in Littleton as a registered elector will see the question or questions on their long ballot. Anyone who is a qualified elector, i.e., property owner, a lessee, or someone who is designated by one of those entities to cast their vote would receive a standalone ballot from the county. And there are forms that need to be filled out to designate an elector, and that's also that we can make sure that it is one voter, one vote. There's no duplication. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Grove. Yeah, I was just a little bit curious about the boundary and how it was decided by the steering committee how to go out. I understand about cutting out that little piece, but going, you know, across Santa Fe, just what was the rationale? I'm curious. Yeah, so this all dates back to Envision Littleton and the future land use maps. So the study area that was identified um, really spoke to the both the community character and then also the land use. Um, and sort of that fabric piece where we identify um, both walkable parts of the city, um, so hence heading a little bit further east. I think there was also a clear indication from the outreach of the community of, of bringing back that connection to the river and downtown um, and really emphasizing that, that connection. So that's, that portion of the study area was included on the other side of Santa Fe. And, um, you know, the the opportunity to kind of think about that land use and how it folds back into the fabric of downtown. Um, we've had conversations both with ACC um, and, and their excitement for being part of. We did talk with them about a portion of their campus or the entirety of the campus. Um, they came back to us with the direction they'd like to see all of the campus in. Um, we've had conversations you know, across Santa Fe with landowners there, uh, as well as conversations with the county, and most importantly, the school district. Um, and we'll continue those conversations with other special districts as well to make sure that, um, we, that everyone has a clear understanding of how this is gonna work and, and um, that they understand the implications as well as the benefits. And that would be looking to the future, obviously, why the land across Santa Fe on the north side might, which is open space, but may not always be that. Right. It, it, is, that, it is not technically open space, but it is vacant land. Vacant yes. land. Thank you. Any other questions? Mayor, can I make a motion to yes, approve please. Ordinance 16-2022? Second. 
So we have a motion and a second to approve ordinance 16-2022 on second reading, submitting to only the registered and qualified electors within the defined boundaries of the proposed downtown development authority, the DDA, a ballot question regarding the creation of a DDA, a ballot question regarding the collection of all revenues, and a ballot question regarding the increase in property taxes. Any further discussion or comments? Seeing yes, not, for me. Yes, Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. Uh, so thank you, uh, folks, for coming out and support, especially some of the business people. I work downtown. I spend my lunch hours walking downtown. Carol, keep making tea. I love that blueberry iced robos that you have. <coughs> Cal, that Southwest chicken sandwich that Grand Station has, the salad, delish. Um, I, again, because I spend so much time walking it, I see kind of the improvements that maybe some of you have voiced tonight. And so I really look forward to make, supporting this on our ballot today and seeing what you all can do. I trust you, like, I know you do good things, you produce amazing amenities for this city that makes it so special and charming. Um, this is also something I campaigned on, so it's actually kind of cool to get to follow through on a campaign promise. So thank you for putting in all your hard work on this effort. Anyone else, Councilmember Barr? Just wanted to recognize Councilmember Driscoll and all the work that he's put in over the years for doing this, so just wanted to say hats off and thank you. Thanks, I'm gonna vote yes. I concur. <laughs> I concur. Um, all right. So um, just to be clear, we are voting to put this on the ballot. We are not necessarily approving it, um, but the, the um, registered electors inside the boundaries will be able to approve it or deny it. Voting for or against? The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. All right. Thank you. And I know... Just like the uh, fireworks show uh, last weekend, we have the grand finale of public hearings here that I'm surprised more people didn't stick around for. Uh, this, this is what everyone, this is what I came for. <clears throat> we have item E uh, uh, is ordinance 17 of 2022, an ordinance on second reading submitting to the registered electors of the city of Littleton, Colorado, a ballot question regarding removing procurement provisions from the city charter and moving them to the city code. We'll have a presentation. We can ask questions, have public hearing, everything that we've been doing tonight. So, city manager. Thank you, Mayor, for this item. I will turn it over to our administrative services director, Ashley Bolton, and our director of finance, T T Tiffany Hooten, and our procurement director, David M. Take it away, Ashley. Good evening, Council. You're on mute. Better? Thank you. Good evening, Council. Ashley Bolton, Administrative Services Director. Tiffany Hooten, Finance Director. I don't think I've said that this night or this evening, sorry. <laughs> Need the reminder. Dave Ems, Procurement Director. We're here tonight to talk about the procurement ballot initiative that's on the schedule for this November. Can you advance the slide? Yeah. Thank you. And this is in regards to removing the capital asset procurement references from the charter and moving them to the city code instead. Uh, as a reminder, we met during a study session on May 10th to go over the, I guess, fine details of why we are asking this. We're gonna try to make it quick tonight and just jump to a reminder of some of those details. Uh, as we noted, our procurement charter in, or language has not been updated since 1959. Uh, if we gave some uh, references to a loaf of bread costing 20 cents at that time, a house costing about $12,000. So it is time for us to make some updates. In terms of the polling results that just came in recently, we have 59% uh, supporting this initiative, as well as 52% saying that we're right on track. 68% saying they improve of Littleton city government and 64% saying they value that the, what they are receiving in terms of taxes paid. So our last question, would you like to put it on the ballot or not? <laughs> <laughs> Council, any questions? No questions. All right, it is 1043. I'm gonna open the public hearing. We have three people signed up. I'm going to call Dan Radulovich up to the mic. <coughs> You're a trooper. Three minutes, Dan. You sure you don't want to give me more? <laughs> <laughs> 
Dan nice. Radulovich, 7,000 South Gallup Street in District 3, where we want to talk about procurement, not artsy-fartsy stuff. <laughs> um, this from a, a, uh, just a city operational standpoint could be the most important thing that's on the ballot this fall. Um, it's clear that the people, when the section of the charter was updated in the late 70s, which is the part I'm going to talk about, about the $5,000, uh, it was updated in 1979, it looked like, um, that they wanted the staff to have some discretion below a particular dollar amount, and $5,000 is what was chosen. Um, in 1979, when this section was revised, $5,000 equates to about $20,000 today. And at every place I've ever worked, including governments, private industry, whatever, uh, you could never buy anything for $20,000. You're going to go through some sort of process. Um, current, as it currently stands, um, it's required that city council approve any purchase of over $5,000. Um, the council, from what I, obs what I have observed over the past few years, seems to be an entity that should be more interested in policy and direction setting, not approving, vir approving virtually every purchase the city makes. This seems far too granular for what your, what your charge is. The draconian policy of accepting the lowest bidder and only the lowest bidder needs to be addressed. As an example, I currently work for a municipality owned chemistry laboratory and I have worked at several private laboratories in my, in my past. Um, we work with equipment that costs anywhere from 50 to $100,000, sometimes even more. We expect this equipment to last at least a decade or longer. There are very few producers of these, of these items and those of us that have worked in the industry a while know which brands are good and which are not. We know who provides the best service, parts, and supplies. We also have to consider how it works with our software and if it is covered under our current service contract. If we are forced to buy the cheapest one, it would, in, it would probably cost more in the long run as our software need, may need to be upgraded. The parts may not last as long, meaning the consumables would cost more. And also, our, our service contract may need to be updated. The moral of the story is that you need to allow your experts to pick what equipment and vendors to work with. Dollar amounts do need to be considered, but they should not be the sole consideration. The poli um, this policy setting should be moved to, to an ordinance level so that, so that it can be changed a bit more easily. Um, of the cities I looked at, all of them use an ordinance to address this issue. Um, this gives the city the opportunity to change dollar amounts and who is approving what dollar amounts at what level as times change and still allows to have the public input on this. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Julie Radulovich. And I see why you said that. Julie was actually listed first. I just yeah. saw Radulovich and just went Dan. Yeah, went to Dan. Best for last. <laughs> so, I'm just so excited that we get to talk about accounting tonight at 1046. Um, Julie Radulovich, District 3. Um, I am in favor of this change to the procurement policy. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, I'm a CPA, and so I've been practicing about 25 years or so, spent about 22 years working as an auditor, so worked with a lot of different organizations, for-profit, not-for-profit, did a lot of single audits, so I got to spend time looking at federal procurement rules, et cetera. So when I look at this, I think that this, what we have right now is incredibly restrictive, and it ties, kind of handcuffs a lot of what the purchasing is. And I think what's important when you have procurement is you need to be flexible and fluid with the policies that you have. So, you know, when you look at what the federal government has, they have different levels of what you need to get, whether it's verbal bids, you know, quick email bids, et cetera. So I would recommend having some type of procurement policies around different levels. Um, and again, you know, get rid of the lowest bidder. I don't think that helps anything. Um, I think as we look forward into the future and we're modernizing everything around us, I think financial policies and procedures need to be modernized too. Um, and then the other thing I think about, you know, just sitting here with the sheer amount of spending that we're going to have with 3A, with, you know, future transportation projects, with the ERP, you know, this is, there's going to be a lot of money that's being spent and we need to make sure that the staff has the uh, ability to make the smartest decisions for the city. So. Um, things to think about, but I totally support this. Thanks. Thank you. And last person to sign up, Pam Chadbourne. I'm Pam Chadbourne, a little block and a half from here, so I'm going to go back to good governance. Um, my concern, and I've said this before to you, is fraud, waste, and abuse. So. It's not as if putting in fraud, waste, and abuse protection means that you sus 
you're suspicious of the people around you. It's simply the job of good governance to put in guardrails and protections so that the city is protected against potential fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, I totally agree with getting rid of the policy that says lowest cost only. That's ridiculous. I agree with raising the amount. Um, but I think that some kind of procurement policy is essential. And council, you should build in the protection against fraud, waste, and abuse. And I don't think moving the change to the code is the right way. Um, it's just not a horrible burden to put this up for election in every so often. Um, $100,000 is a lot. And you know you can design that and finesse it over time. Um, if it's in the code, I want to see fraud, waste, and abuse addressed. Um, I, again, this is basic good governance. I'm gonna, I worked in, in a federal uh, institution, several of them under the FAR, and boy, I was totally afraid of those procurement rules. Um, and I, I want to see the city protected against fraud, waste, and abuse. So, um, council, you haven't heard any technical input about what this should be, um, but I think it's essential. Uh, and I'm sorry it's not there, and I'm not sure what you can do at this point. It should be done, but uh, we need the protections. Thanks. Thank you. Is anyone else wish to speak? Mr. Bingham? Good evening again, Council. Paul Bingham, 236 West Delaware Circle. I'm surprised this wasn't changed a long time ago. I'm not a procurement guy, but I've <clears throat> been an engineer out at Martin Marietta for a long time, and I was on the end of a bunch of things. Hey, you procurement guys, go go buy me these things. And a, a situation like this would have been a disaster. Anyway, this simply needs to be changed, please, now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one, I'm going to close the public comment at 10.51. Uh, I think the city manager would like to respond, I think probably to the question I have in my head, but I'll let you go. Thank you, Mayor. I'll just make the comment. It's important to me that uh, the council here as its staff has had, you know, several conversations even since, even since I've been here about the importance of a more comprehensive purchasing ordinance. And I think the, the, the capital bid thresholds and the lowest bidder provision is, is really just the, the tip of the iceberg in terms of a comprehensive you know, pr procurement policy that is contained in an ordinance um, that gives council the, the opportunity to kind of you know, have that dialogue with staff periodically about not only those bid thresholds, but also about approval levels and the accountability and, and procurement reporting uh, structures that I believe should also be in place. So um, I, I'm glad to see that, that this is, is being proposed, but um, I'll also say that I'm eager to work with our, our, our staff here to develop a, a, a not, not only a current bid threshold for capital, but a, you know, modern, comprehensive uh, procurement ordinance. And that ordinance could include fraud, waste, and abuse? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, I would say one of, the, one of the subsections of that would be kind of an ethics in procurement as well. Um, you know, things that we would typically uh, not do, you know, in terms of nepotism and, and giving contracts to this and that. Um, but it should be pretty expansive to protect against um, some of those dangers of awarding, you know, contracts for jobs, things like that that you see. Great, thanks. Council, any other questions? All right, seeing no other questions, I'll entertain a motion. I move to approve ordinance 17-2022 on second reading. Second. So we have a motion and a second to approve ordinance 17-2022 on second reading, submitting to the registered electors of the city of Littleton, Colorado, a ballot question regarding removing procurement provisions from the city charter and moving them to the city code. So just to be clarified, we're not changing this. We're asking the voters to do it. We're just putting on the ballot. Okay, let's see if I can get this to vote here. I have to recall. 
All right. The vote is seven in favor. The motion carries unanimously. I need some time off. All right. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, and I just want to thank everyone who stayed for the entire show tonight. Um, and we are adjourned.